welcome to Exploring Antinatalism. I'm your host for today, Mark Maharaj. In today's episode, I sat down with YouTubers Perspective Philosophy and Vegan Antinatalist. Links to their channel will be in the description. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Uh, so thank you, Vegan Antinatalist and Perspective Philosophy for um, meeting up. Um, you were you had a you were curious about antinatalism, um, uh, Lewis, and I figured uh, it'd be interesting to have vegan antinatalists to explain um, some of his arguments for antinatalism. Uh, and I sent you uh, um, his formal argument um, on Reddit. Yeah, I, I watched it. Um, I watched uh, two of your videos. I think I watched your first video, which was um, your submission to the antinatalist challenge one, um, which was your first argument. Um, against antinatalism and then i also watched the second one that mark sent us uh today i watched that one and uh the former one on reddit as well i didn't check the former one out yet but uh i think mainly because i, I didn't feel like i need to i thought you explained your position quite well on the video did you have any questions about because like you obviously disagree with the v uh, with the antinatalist position right well i mean the be beautiful thing was is that like in the rebuttal that you gave to the asymmetry argument was essentially the position that i was trying to give to um superhuman dance but uh, more eloquently given obviously by uh, yeah. a, a more capable philosopher i think um i think it almost comes down to common sense i think like when you rely upon a what's the word a no it's not necessarily a, what's, what's the word there's a word that i'm looking for and it's uh it's not a relation but a I will remind. I will remember the word in a minute. But anyway, essentially, when you judge something off of something else, so um, when you rely upon the standard of uh, when you rely upon another standard, it's like a, a comparison, right? But I can't. There's a there's a better word to use. It's a comparative theory, isn't it? The asymmetry argument. Essentially, you compare in two possible worlds one in which someone doesn't exist and one in which someone does exist. And you use that to come to the conclusion that actually it is better not to exist because there is suffering in one world whilst there's not suffering in the other. Yet it doesn't take into consideration the, the well-being or the pleasure of, or, or, the, or the, you know, the happiness, whatever positive uh, phenomenological experience you wish to attribute to human life and say that, or, or animal life as well, and say that that is the, the goal of the function. It doesn't take them into consideration. And I feel like that, that in itself is, is a somewhat, like, I think that's the mistake in, in the first place. I think the asymmetry argument, as I think you pointed out, if ran through its conclusion, becomes the symmetry argument in which you end up with, um, you end up essentially comparing three possible worlds and not two, or a multitude of possible mm -hmm. worlds. And then that just falls into any deliberative um, theoretical judgment. So we would say that, it's not necessarily the case that you should be an anti-natalist because you're comparing these two possible worlds because there is a multitude of possible worlds in which the situation may be better if a child was born. So that's kind of the position I'm taking. I'm taking the position not, not of a pro-natalist. Uh, I'm not going to say that everyone at all times should have children, but rather I will reject the anti-natalist position saying that it is you are unjustified at having a child at any given situation, that it is wrong, that you... you do not have that uh, moral authority, we'll say. So, yeah, and I think your argument that you ended up uh, falling back on after the fall of the, uh, uh, the anti-symmetry argument, I'm sorry, the anti-symmetry argument was essentially the argument of consent. And I think that falls to the exact same criticism that the anti-natalism, uh, anti the asymmetry argument falls to. So the asymmetry argument, the main problem was that it was using a... Um, See, I wrote the notes down. No, uh, hey, Lewis, um, can you stop right there and clarify my position on uh, consent? Yeah, absolutely. So the consent, the consent in my kind of formulation is not an essential part of the argument. It's like kind of just like a qualifier in a possible right. situation. So in my opinion, it's wrong. So to cause or to risk unnecessary harm to another human being. And so that's the real argument except for if that person could give informed consent, then that would be justified. That's where consent comes into my argument. So, so you'd say that the only way you could do something wrong is if you can give consent. 
Like you could do something that would cause suffering rather if you could give consent. Um, that is the only time it would be justified. I mean, that, right. It, it, the only time that you can harm somebody, in my opinion, or, or subject them to great harm or risk of great harm, basically, is if that person can give you an informed set consent by basically being able to make that choice for themselves. Why would you say that they would require consent? I mean, I feel like it's just pretty intuitive that if you're going to subject somebody to harm or risk harm to somebody else, that seems just seems like a very basic ethical principle to me. You see, I would say that it's because when we talk about consent, if we're doing something that was unconsensual, like for example, rape is an unconsensual sexual act, we'll say like, or that's me dog, um, or um, you know, sexual assault of any kind, it's unconsensual. And the reason that the consent is important is because you are in breach of the individual's liberty to choose for themselves. That, that, is, the, that is the suffering that is occurring. You are taking away their sovereignty. I don't know if we agree with that. I think it's, I think it's the harm. <laughs> you think it's the harm? You see, I, I don't, I, I think... Um, now part of the if, harm it was, if it was the harm, if it was the harm, then why is it okay to commit harm if someone consents? Because they're make, because they're able to make that choice themselves, right? Because they're able to act as their own sovereign, right? Uh, uh, you know, agent. They're able to act as a free agent within the world, and their liberty is respected. Right, right. But, but I think it comes down to what's reducible. See, like when we're talking about the asymmetry, for me, I feel like there's an an asymmetry. Not referring to Benatar's asymmetry, but I refer to two different asymmetries. One is called the value asymmetry which is based on um, intuitive arguments, but also arguments like uh, motivation. So there's like a psychologist, Kahneman, I think I mentioned it in one of my videos, that kind of studies like uh, motivation and risk and things and how people value that. And it, it's almost always comes down to people value like uh, the uh, aversion to harm than like the possibility of reward, like by almost twice. Um, of course, I mean like the, the w w there's something to be said, one, like if, even if we look at the, the psychology, one, psychology is like, I'm, I'm just going to outright say psychology is not a science. Um, that, that's, uh, I think that's, uh, it's, it's a nonsense claim for psychology to be called a science. But I would go so far to say that, one, even if it was a science, even if we were making scientific arguments, we'd have to be very sure of the study and, and how it's done. Um, the yeah. population sample and also the, the overall effect that like psychology can have uh, psycholo psychological differences can have. For example, uh, an individual within contemporary society um, could come from a variety of backgrounds. There could be a Christian, there could be a Muslim, there could be an atheist, there could be um, a vegan, there could be very various amount of ideological differences between the individuals which create um, um, a psychological disposition towards certain conceptualizations, right? So, for example, where um, one person would see fear, the other person may feel excitement. A good example would be like, if you think of like a Viking and a warrior mentality, the mm. idea of battle was something that was supposed to, to inspire like, you know, uh, excitement in, in a Viking. And even though that it seems like a horrible scenario, although it seems like it would inspire dread in almost everyone, it, it could inspire excitement. That just shows like a variation of psychology, which I think undermines most psychological claims of um, how humans will behave. That, that's the problem. No, no, now, no. We're talking about sub <clears throat> so subjectivity, we're not talking about specific episodes or specific types of things that are universal for all human beings. We're just talking about the very basic experience of suffering and well-being. Right? Yeah, like how, how, we'll, we'll, um, how we will behave towards suffering versus how we will behave towards uh, well-being. And I, I think that itself... I the experience like, of it not not the specifics of it like not that this kind of thing this kind of uh perspective is going to cause one person suffering or another i'm talking about it doesn't matter every sentient being experiences suffering every sentient experiences well-being and those i would agree with that i would agree with that and every sentient being is going to ascribe negativity or badness to that suffering i agree goodness to that well-being but then it's what is ascribed the negative and positive isn't it uh, yeah i think it's tautology in my opinion but I, I mean like no no i i no, i agree i mean like what what of our experiences though 
are uh, ascribed the negative and positive states of being. So what will I experience as positive versus what you will experience as positive are two separate things. Right, right. Yeah. But there's, <laughs> and I think we, we can know, agree that that's like the... Behind there. Um, but like, I think what the point you're trying to get at is um, suffering simpliciter is more of a motivation than than mm-hmm. pleasure. Like, and I think, you know, um, what's he called? Uh, I can't remember his name now. It's just video. Uh, Machiavelli makes that point. You know, is it better to be loved or feared? Feared. Uh, right. You'll have much more power over someone if you're feared. <laughs> um, uh, and I, th- I think that's, that's a valid point. I think we do flee pain a lot more and in not many cases than we do seek suffering. But I think that the important thing is to recognize the balance of pain and pleasure within a given individual is the point of ethics. So when we seek the good and bad of, uh, of, of our experiences, the reason that we create ethics is to try and maximize the good whilst minimizing the bad. And seek certain pleasures whilst understanding that there will be a pain attached to them. I think that the understanding that there is, um, there is no such thing as a pleasure without a pain and a pain without a pleasure. But I do think that some pleasures outweigh the pains that are induced um, when you, when you receive them. So like, for example, we could say that the, the pleasure of um, the pleasure of, I don't know, learning may um, outshine the pain of reading the book, you know, and obviously there's, there's a definite variation there of whether who you are and the circumstances you're in. But I think that there are certain aspects of life in which if we were to pay attention, we would see that there are higher pleasures and lower pleasures in the words of John Stuart Mill, and that certain pleasures should be maximized when certain, and certain pains will also be you know, increased with them, whilst certain, uh, on the other hand, certain pleasures should be minimized because the pains will also be reduced with them too. So we shouldn't be hedonists because hedonism will ultimately cause more suffering than uh, pleasure. Sorry guys, I just missed an entire thing because my internet was off. Oh no, uh, that's fine. Um, I was just essentially saying that I would take the position of someone like John Stuart Mill in this, like there are higher and lower pleasures. There are, there are that to not different, differentiate between pleasure is, is a problem. And I think Plato shows that in Gorgias, that it is not, we do not, simply characterize pleasure and pain as simply one or the other there is varying kinds of pleasures and varying kinds of pains which each relate to their own uh experience of life which is a combination of pleasure and pain so the pain of reading a book also may entail the pleasure of education and knowledge whilst the um you know the pain of uh, the pleasure of you know drinking you know, entails the pleasure of a hangover and uh, perhaps even, even you know, existential uh, uh, problems afterwards if you feel like meaningless and whatever it is. So you can actually find that uh, like when we're talking about pleasures and pains, we should differentiate not simply by pleasure and pain, good and bad. I think that is too simplistic. I think it is more, it makes more sense to differentiate between types of pleasure types of pain and work out whether one is worth the other. And I think that, that just be a psychological experiment, I haven't seen able to um, show what pains are worth what pleasures yet. I don't think psychology works like that. And I, and I also think that psychology couldn't work like that. I think that it comes down to the point of uh, the, f- the freedom of choice part of the agent, where they have to understand the ethical desidera around them and understand the values that exist within the world, at least from what we can work out and then try and deduce it. And I think that's the realm of ethics and not psychology anyway. Um, I actually had, I wanted to ask him this, cause like you guys mentioned, you don't want to harm someone uh, without their consent. Mm-hmm. Um, but we do that all the time um, well, in terms uh, of like uh, risking someone. So I think part of the formulation or his formal argument was, uh, Okay, so uh, one ought not harm or impose risk of harm upon another. Exceptions to the premise. Uh, if the harm or risk is imposed is to prevent greater harm or if consent has been secured. I'll agree with the consent then. Um, so one ought not harm or impose risk or harm upon another. Um, well, I think I would honestly, I wouldn't write that, you see, because I would say one ought not to, one ought not uh, unnecessarily harm or impose unnecessary risk upon another, or even um, unjustified. Right. 
Um, so I, I would say that I would have a problem with the first premise because that implies that all harm is unjustified whilst not. Agreed. So like, yeah, because like he mentions these exception criteria of harm. Uh, these are, so he was like, these are essential harms intrinsic to life on earth. Um, because yeah, I was thinking like driving, giving kids vaccines, medical care. There's a lot of things that we do, right? Yeah. And I think as well, it's like what's called the, um, what Robert Nozick calls um, the principle of compensation anyway. So like he says about tras trespassing upon another's property, for example. All right, guys. <laughs> um, hello, man. How's it going? It's going well. I never have internet problems. And for some reason, my internet is... It's just, just as soon as uh, you need it. That's, that's typical, man. Um, so going on what you're going on, and I'll just listen for a bit. Um, um, well, although we're just, we're, just, uh, we're just mentioning your argument. Um, you're just saying, like, uh, you had some questions for us, really. Um, I was saying that I have a problem with the first premise. Um, but, really? You know, that's interesting, because that's, like, the most intuitive premise of the whole thing. Yeah, that's probably why I have a problem with it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, go ahead then. Um, okay, so, um, but, so like, obviously, welcome back, uh, vegan you. online analyst. <laughs> um, if you hadn't heard what I said before, I had basically just outlined that I think that we should differentiate between pains and pleasures. Some pleasures are worth some pains, some pains are worth some pleasures, and that's the goal of ethics, um, especially if you take John Street and Mill to be true. Um, that's why we're, we understand what duties and our duties reflect the nature of humanity. Right. So, but, anyway. but hold on just a second. But that is also subjective, just like you're talking about. Some pains are worth some pleasures is a subjective thing. Well, uh, I mean, it's, it's subjective in the sense that I think that uh, it, it, incur it, it, it incurred in subjects. Like, I think it's, it's um, we can agree that there are subjects that experience pain and pleasure, but I think that there are, that there is a fundamental human nature that need, need be respected within ethics. And that mm -hmm. isn't necessarily um like, like for example for example like uh i'll say the fundamental human nature that it need be respected in everyone uh is in relation to this to subjectivity itself that we are subjects that we are free agents and that we should allow be we sh should be allowed to act as free agents and in our goal as free agents we are given goals by our nature right so uh to avoid pain and seek pleasure would be a, a very um obvious goal like to seek good and avoid bad not necessarily pain and pleasure because that's a bit, I think a little bit simplistic because I think many people would choose pain if it was meaningful uh, right. than pleasure. Therefore yeah, it was I meaningless. I agree. So yeah, I think I would basically say that there is a fundamental human nature in the sense that we'll have a function and that ethics, is seeks, ethics seeks to respect the function of humanity and we enter ethics for somewhat selfish reasons, but come to realize that ethics is... Um, inclusive i think that would be the right word that were it's, it's based on a fundamental or in the words of levinas a primordial equality and that we're all almost in each other's um dependence and i can't work out what is good for me without you and you can't work out what is good for you without me uh, and so that this idea of something being totally subjective in the sense that you know someone may very well enjoy heroin very much that is subjective whether heroin is good for the life is most likely not object not not subjective it the the inferences built upon their enjoyment um require um individuals to verify and falsify yeah. and i think even the the um whether they should indulge in a certain desire because this is what i would say ethics was about whether we should actually take heroin or that we shouldn't take heroin is the pr purpose of ethics and for that um for that argument to be presented and judged as correct or or incorrect requires epistemics and that requires, I would argue, uh, relations between uh, individuals. So, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's essentially like a, a very quick overview of like my, my understanding of ethics. And in that, I think when we look at like higher and lower pleasures, what we're actually doing there is working out whether the good life uh, in terms of uh, an individual's experiences uh, correlates to their, their end goal. So if, you're, if your goal is to live a for example, a, a, a pleasurable life, and so you take heroin, and then you haven't actually taken into consideration the pains of withdrawal, then you are acting irrationally, and you have defied your own, your own ends. And as we, in ethics, as we set ends for ourselves, we find that they become falsified until we uh, better understand human nature and what ends we should truly seek. And that's the, the telos of ethics, is the, 
the good of the good of us all, the good simpliciter. Um, okay. Yeah, I don't think I disagree with anything you've said so far, but I don't oh, think it's like, like a, yeah. <laughs> You're like yeah. the only person. <laughs> so so um, I can see how my argument could still fit in that framework. Oh, absolutely. I mean, especially if you were to say that like uh, pain was worse than pleasure. Like it wasn't worth it not at, at all. Um, I just don't see the evidence of that. Um, well, you know, I don't say just pain. I just mean like harm as in like pain, suffering, just badness. Negative like, experience. Just like an exemplar, like Dr. Like uh, Benatar says, like he's not actually talking about just simple pain and, ple pain and pleasure in his asymmetry. It's just an exemplar for pain, meaning like all the badness. You could even talk about the pains of nihilism, couldn't you? I mean, like the, one of the things that's, yeah. um, you know, corrupt in our society today is this idea that we'll have nihilistic, uh, the nihilistic sense of um, meaninglessness that's permeated most of our culture, which, which I think has yeah. impacted our suicide rates, you know, our yeah. drug addiction rates and, and, and a plethora of other problems um, in which I mean, people flee yeah. in bad yeah. faith. Yeah. And I think that, I mean, that, I mean, that, that alone, like maybe an, a motivator to not have a child in this culture, um, which I would agree. I think that it, <laughs> to not have a child in this culture might be a problem. Uh, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not actually going to argue against that because I think there is very big problems with our culture that need resolved before I would feel comfortable having a child into an environment where I thought they were actually going to have a possibility of happiness. So I think I wouldn't want to raise a child that's going to have an existential crisis and kill themselves at the age of 25. So <laughs> I don't think that's, a good, uh, I think that's a good society to birth someone into. But then it becomes, um, uh, rather than saying like, um, it is wrong to have children, the unanimous position, it becomes, it is wrong to have children under certain conditions, which I don't think uh, anyone necessarily, anyone in the right mind, I don't think would, would, would uh, disagree with that, that you, there would have to be a pronatalist, that they should have children right. in all cases. And I think that that's, that's, uh, that's madness. <laughs> uh, right, right. So sometimes in our community, we, we call that like uh, global and local antinatalism or soft and hard antinatalism. So you, it sounds like you mm. have more like a soft kind of antinatalist position. Like it's, you know, it's wrong. Call it antinatalism because I think antinatalism implies, um, like, uh, implies uh, that it is wrong to have children. When if you say that yeah. it is wrong to have children under a certain circumstances, you could still say it is right to have children under other circumstances. Right. Right. So, right. Yeah. So, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Um, yeah, and and I agree with that. Like, I think a lot of people uh, agree with that as well. But um, what I want to posit is that um, there is lots of suffering to be had, even in the best society, in the best culture. Uh, uh, true, true. I, I agree there. I think natural, that... An unjust... Sorry, let me finish real quick. Yeah, sorry. There's all kinds of natural injustices in the world. And there's people born that are unable to follow their goals, that are unable to do to become like a heroic individual, to find meaning, to find love, to find these things just because of their natural circumstances. You know, it's funny that you use the word heroic there. That's, um, you know, uh, Mark was joking. He was saying like, hopefully you won't bring up Hegel, you know, of course I am going to. Uh, and the, the reason I'm going to bring up Hegel is because uh, Hegel says, um, there's a specific point in which he talks about heroic morality. And he says, um, the was it the death of heroes is not the destruction of our best but the triumph of truth uh and the point that he was trying to make is that heroic morality is a self-imposed notion of um a self-imposed ethic in which the individual instantiates a, a culture uh from a from basically the state of nature that there was this one individual that was said you know what we're going to have rules we're going to have um, or even a group of individuals who you would say were heroic in the sense that they, without justification, uh, essentially established a society. And then from that society, we were able to, you know, create epistemics and knowledge and, you know, better uh, our institutions. But the very institutions themselves had to be born out of absurdity because they could not have had the rationality which is in the institution from which to derive uh, the justification. Um, in the case of her her heroism, it's like this idea of um, being a hero. Um, it's, it's funny that Hegel would say that we shouldn't want to be heroes. Heroes should be a thing of the past. We should want to be um, just functional members of society, as in like, we should want to just live 
um, live our lives and that society should make were as better than heroes because it is the triumph of the truth. We have overcome the absurdity that of what heroism was and we have bettered ourselves to a new point. And uh, in, term, in terms of like, for example, you could say that someone uh, becomes disabled, for example, and is incapable of becoming um, um, a figure of um, a, f- a figurehead of whatever passion that they had. So like the, the, the like, let's say that the harmed, like from a, from a disease at the age of five, they wanted to become a footballer, but then they lose the use of their legs below the knee. Um, you could see that as them being unable to um, fulfill their goals. I would take Sartre's point and say that the problem in the first place was the goals they were trying to fulfill. So it's not that they are in a position where they could not experience happiness. It's that their, their suffering, their anguish comes at the, the it comes in the um, correspondence between their identity that they wish to assert and what they are, which is a nothingness, which is an absence of an identity. It's actually possibility itself. And the way that we, or, or, uh, the way that we um, free ourselves from that is by rejecting the previous identity and instead seeking the, the good life, a self-determination. I may respect that I wanted to have been a footballer and say, okay, this is terrible. I'm in a tragic scenario where I am no longer able to pursue my dream. But the problem, my happiness then isn't the inability to pursue my dream. My happiness is then my inability to let go of the dream, which is no longer actualizable. And instead, this is why Sartre would say something like the disabled man disables himself. You could become an activist for disabled rights and live a meaningful life in that respect. You can find meaning in other places. And it is the possibilities of, of our experience and from which we should deliberate on, not the impossibilities. And the, the, the trying to set ourselves as a, a given determined uh, identity imposed upon these possibilities is what causes us the suffering in the first place so when you say like people experience these natural evils don't get me wrong i do think there is natural evils and i do think that people have to find new and creative ways to overcome them at times but our overcoming of suffering or overcoming of uh you know obstacles is part of the 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 value of life because if we learn to overcome um from a state of deprivation we can then appreciate with more uh, certainty, th- those things that we were deprived of. If we, you know, if you come from a place of of starvation and then you rise to become, you know, uh, someone who's in a place of uh, plenty, then you can say that you'll probably be more appreciative of the plenty of, than someone who was born into it, um, simply because of the psychological differences that have occurred throughout that life. And I think that's the I think that's the real um, the cusp there. That there are natural evils, don't get me wrong, there are negatives in our experience, but how we approach the negatives really does make a difference. And this doesn't necessarily, just in case anyone's wondering, this doesn't necessarily entail some sort of metaphysical libertarianism. I'm not saying that you have to tell yourself that you're not suffering and that you can just out, you know, think you're suffering away. That's that's certainly not the case. But rather how you approach suffering um truly changes um the narrative of your life. And, and I think yeah, no, no. still there's, a more meaningful there was a lot there. there was a lot you just said <laughs> and there was a lot of assumptions there um, I think that kind of goes back to that whole idea that like suffering like instrumental versus intrinsic suffering and like yes you can use suffering as an instrument to achieve something greater to achieve meaning but that doesn't negate the fact that suffering is still intrinsically bad and if we're talking about ethics we're talking about the relationship between people and possibly other sentient beings Hmm. And you ha- don't have a right to impose suffering on somebody else. And let me, let me say one more thing. Um, you know, what you were saying was all well and good, but there's some people that literally have no faculties to be able to transform their suffering into something better. They can't even form goals because of their suffering. Hmm. So like someone who's like severely mentally disabled, for example. Right, because um, I work with those people all the time. <laughs> And I can tell. And if you see someone suffering like that, you see somebody who can't even form a coherent thought or their thoughts are so scattered. Mm. What would you say to that? I think that, I think don't get me wrong, like 
it's like, for example, am I against euthanasia? Let's say like someone was suffering so badly because of a physical ailment. Um, should we euthanize them? I think that it depends as the possibility of pleasure there, like in terms of can they live a valuable life? If we determine that they can't live a valuable life, that their life is going to purely get worse and worse as time goes on, and that the narrative is only, a, it's, a, it's, in a, it's a perpetual state of negativity, you know, like from birth to death, they will suffer and the suffering will become greater over that time. End their life. Do them the favor and end, them, end their life. Um, especially if they can't find any, any purpose for it, if, the, if it's like a meaningless scenario, like that suffering without reason, uh, the suffering cannot end. They cannot find any joy because of the suffering. Um, I think that we would be monsters to allow that person to, to live. <laughs> um, Wouldn't you be a monster to bring that person into existence? No. Why not? Could you have, like, I mean, if you actually deliberately brought, <laughs> like, if you, like, sabotaged the pregnancy so that they would be um, uh, intentionally brought uh, into existence in a life of perpetual suffering, then, yeah, I would say so. But not, not in all cases. The like, if 99.9% right? of births are not in that scenario, then why do you think that you would be, would you be, is it wrong to gamble? that 0.1% against the 99% people who live happy lives, for example. Well, I would say that 99% of well, people live happy lives. Uh, it's, it's more more like a thought experiment, really. We're not, not the, obviously, the, that, it gets back to what I said before. It's a deliberative state in which we have to weigh the justifications of uh, the, the, the positives and the negatives against one another. What is the likelihood that I will raise a child that will live a meaningful life versus the, uh, and, a, and a life of happiness than a child that will live a life of, suffering and you know perpetual misery um i think that's essentially the point like if we need to ask those questions and I, that, this is the beautiful thing about this uh kind of conversational kind of piece that we're talking about really i would say is that it, it's at least making people think should i have children that is the, that is the first thing that people, everyone regardless of your position you need to question whether you should have children because go forth and multiply is not the not the ethic you should be applying in this scenario um, but I do not think that that one point, that zero point one percent, justifies um, the that is a it unjustifies all of the other pregnancies, um, or if the balance is you know disproportionate. So now we'll come on to what balance is justifiable. Really, I think that's that's the question. Then how many yeah. Um, yeah, how many cases point. of uh, like suffering for how many cases of like well being? Sure. And. And I think the problem with the antinatalist position is that uh, like a lot of the time it uh, does what liberalism does with Maximin reasoning and John Rawls. Uh, it sneaks in, it smuggles in the type of rationality which proves itself. So John Rawls argues that we should maximize the minimum because um, it le leads to the greatest uh, reduction of inequality. Mm -hmm. And what Alastair McIntyre and Robert Nosek point out is saying that it's essentially smuggled in a type of reasoning that leads to its own conclusion. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And I think that can happen with antinatalism as well, or, or any position, like pronatalism on the other hand as well, or, or whatever it is. You can create a type of reasoning in which the risk-reward scenario is seen as rational if the other person uh, comes to the conclusion from which you do. And then, then that's, that, that would be an issue. So then I would say that there is, I couldn't give you an answer. I don't think I could give you an answer. What would be the justifiable ratio um, you know, of pain, uh, you know, possible. Is there even doing. a relationship there? Oh That's yeah, I think so. I think that there is a, like, for example, if you say like, uh, if you've got Huntington's disease, right. And, um, I know someone who does and, um, you know, it's, it's genetic and it's very, it's a 50, 50 chance pretty much, um, that you're going to pass it on to your children. Uh -huh. And, I don't think, as much as I think that the person that has it's a nice person and so on, I don't think you are justified in passing that disease on to a child. If you know that it's going to cause you this much suffering, if the life is that painful, would you be justified in taking the action to cause that suffering to another? Because you, you know there's going to be a 50-50 chance that they would have a life that's going to end prematurely, uh, painfully, and require you know, even societal resources to sustain. So then you're taking into consideration also the global, uh, you know, the, the national economic position, 
the ecological position and, and there's a variety of other positions that are taken into consideration in the, in the creation of a life. Uh, but even just on that, you know, does it cause pain? I don't think that would be justifiable because the risk reward ratio is certainly too high. I think you're taking a bit of a gamble there. And I, I don't think it's, ra- it's a rational gamble. You know that you are likely to cause the suffering of an agent. Now, this is the point. It's like, at what point do we say, like, is it a 10% chance? Is that a justifiable risk? A 1% chance? And it, and it comes to the point of like, what kind of rationality do we employ? And the issue is, is that our rationality, uh, our reasoning is inherently tied into the, the content of our arguments and, um, and the rationality of our institutions. And so many of us at least operate, I think Alastair McIntyre says, three rival modes of rationality related to um, the traditions in which we have been raised. And so, you know, a Christian, for example, might have a very different rationality to a liberal. Um, like a Catholic might have a very different rationality to a liberal and they'll come to very different conclusions, even though they're both employing reason with, uh, and logic with rigor. And it's not that logic is flawed and it's not that their rationality isn't being applicated properly. The problem is with their rationality. So now we need to investigate the epistemics of how to resolve the confliction in traditions and what is a justifiable risk to take. Uh, it seems that many of us will say intuitively, 50% is a, is a risk too high and uh, 0.001% might say that's okay. But it's where in between do we come to the conclusion that it is justified or not justified. And I think that's where the conversation really needs to be. Yeah, yeah, that, that is a difficult that is a difficult um, calculus, I guess, to make. Um, but in my in my opinion, sometimes I even wonder if the good, quote unquote, or pleasure at all, can even can ever justify the what I would call morally relevant suffering. So every person is going to experience morally relevant suffering, right? So it's not just like oh, point one percent. Every person is going to experience morally relevant suffering. And then it becomes whether or not, you know, you are imposing your belief that they, you believe that that child is going to ex- consider it worthy of it or say that my life is worth this morally relevant suffering. Um, <clears throat> I mean, true. Um, but I, I don't think it's just about whether they consider their life worth it or not. It's about whether their life was worth it or not. Do you know what I mean? You could be, uh, you could have a good life and still look at it as if it's a bad life. And I think that's a problem. Um, I don't. I, I'm I not think sure that could make it into a bad on life. That, on that one. I think it could. Sure. Ma- I think it could make it into a bad life. As in, like, you've approached a, what could have been a good life with a negative psychology, which is causing you more suffering. And the words of Seneca: "We suffer far. Was it? We suffer far more in our imaginations than we do in reality." Yeah. Uh, yeah right. um, and that, that's kind of what I meant by that. Okay. Um, when, when you say morally relevant suffering. Um, would you not say that there was uh, one? I want to know what you mean by morally relevant suffering versus morally irrelevant suffering. But would you say that there was not morally relevant pleasure or happiness there? Like the, there's the obviously the inverse, and that one would be in a relationship with the other. Right. Well, I, I think there's an asymmetry between our obligations as well, right? So it's, and, and I'm still not seeing where you're fundamentally disagreeing with my premise one. So. I, Later, I want you to describe a, a situation where you believe that it's okay or morally justifiable to cause harm or risk great harm for somebody else in our okay. day-to-day life. Not, not in the, you know, not in the uh, particular instance that we're talking about now, but just like in our day-to-day in life. In general, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what I would say like would be morally relevant suffering would be, you know, like a morally irrelevant suffering would be like a pin prick or whatever. And then, of course, like it's not a relationship between two people. Um, so, a morally relevant type of suffering would be oh, like right. it's, uh, a it's harm it's caused to somebody else. Yeah, a harm caused to somebody else where they experience suffering, where it's, uh, I guess, like significant from their own subjective perspective. Right. So, you'd say that, like, for example, but then I would say that morally relevant pleasure, I would say that like, for example, meaning, meaningful experiences are interpersonal. I don't think happiness can be achieved individually. Um, I think that's the point of ethics. I'd say that like, um, like in the words of the Greeks, you know, eudaimonia, it is uh, virtue and happiness are one and the same. And that's an inter- interpersonal uh, relationship. 
Um, There's an asymmetry between our obligations, right? Like we have a, our first obligation is not to harm them. Like we don't have a similar obligation to produce some kind of happiness or joy in them. See, I don't think the obligation is to the pain and pleasure as much as the obligation is to the expression of subjectivity. And that subjectivity relates to pain and pleasure. So in the expression of my subjectivity, the, the goal of my subjectivity is to, to I would say, experience more uh, pleasure than pain. And if I'm not, if I'm, if I'm incapable of being a rational subjective agent, then that's the point in which I would say that I'm being like morally harmed. Um, I take, for example, uh, you know, if I'm imprisoned or if, you know, someone puts a gun to my head or something like that, you know, they're inhibited, inhibiting my liberty. That is like one of the, pre- one of the most easy forms of harm to, to come to me because it's uh, the first dimension of power. It's an authoritative power that is overriding my will from which I wish to act upon the world. Then you can have political, um, you know, like someone silencing my political um, endeavors uh, without justification. So like, for example, if I'm just trying to, you know, maybe we should be socialist guys, you know, and like, you know, better dead than red comes around and, you know, uh, you know, starts like beating us up or something, you know, um, then I'm being, or not even beating us up, but like even just not allowing me to speak. Let's say you're not allowed to speak in this public area. And I'm being silenced politically. And then on the third way, there's the third dimension of power in this respect, uh, being being um, uh, corrupted ideologically. And uh, this is like discipline and um, social norms from which I can be convinced that I'm acting in my own interests when I'm actually acting in the interests of another. So I can be indoctrinated. Mm-hmm. Um, I think all of these relate to uh, the how we should govern our society because I think that the, the best society reduces the amount of uh, and maximizes the subjectivity of a given individual by preventing them from inhibiting each other's subjectivity. So we follow various guidelines, uh, you know, duties, obligations to prevent each other from causing harm to each other by inhibiting one another's uh, subjectivity. But also it prevents us from inhibiting our own. So one of the biggest problems that people face is a problem of reasoning, right? And uh, we we'll always come to uh, everyone, this is everyone, we always make shitty conclusions. We'll, we'll, make, we'll make problems uh, for ourselves by coming to false conclusions. And it's only through other people that we can aid someone to gain out of that. Now, I'd say that the, the point of like, should you help someone receive pleasure and so on like that, that's not necessarily the point. I think that like the helping yourself is in ethics, the first, as the first obligation ethics, like that's how you get into it. And in that is entailed helping other people and that when you try and when you have an obligation to someone else it reflects how you wish to live your life and what is the good life for you and we express that on a simpliciter level it it becomes universalized in in an almost Kantian respect the kingdom of ends and so do i have an obligation to cause describing my entire video (laughs) (laughs) well um do we have uh, an obligation to cause uh, pleasure for someone it's not the obligation to the pleasure, it's the obligation to the individual and an obligation to ourselves. And in that, we have an obligation to live a good life and a good life entails pleasure. Um, and in which case, I would say that we have an obligation entailed from that to cause them good, to cause good experiences, to help them receive happiness as much as to prevent suffering. Probably the long way around of explaining it, but I just wanted to explain, like, obviously... The, why I'm, I'm not saying that like, you know, you have, you have an obligation to just cause the greatest happiness without consideration, because then that's essentially the problem I think uh, your first premise actually comes into. So one ought not harm or impose risk of harm upon another. That is the first premise of your argument. Right. Um, I think that it, said, it should say instead one, not, one ought not cause unjust, unjustifiable harm or impose unjustifiable risk of harm upon another. Okay, and I think that if you add justifiable in there, it it takes harm as being harm is negative, right? But that we are justified in causing harm at times. Like I think uh, Mark actually gave a good example of saying like vaccinations. Mm-hmm. Um, you cause the harm of a vaccination, uh, and instrumentally to to create a, a greater to a greater yeah. good, that would be the instrumental harm. And this is the idea of justifi- justified harm. You would, would you say, I would say that it causing unnecessary or um, unjustifiable harm, for example, like animal agriculture, slitting an animal's throat for pleasure, 
mm-hmm. that would be on that would be unjustified and that way we should not cause that kind of harm um but i i also think that um there isn't a moral uh there isn't a moral good in causing unjustified pleasure either you know if if you're giving someone um you could give someone pleasure uh continuously but without without actually doing them any good if if you understand me yeah, so yeah, like yeah, you can so. you can be a sycophant for example and boost up mm-hmm. their ego but then that might actually cause them not only instrumentally in the sense that it would cause them harm in the future but it might even not bring them genuine a genuine feeling of happiness and well-being overall yeah. the course of their life yeah yeah i got you there i got you there liz um can we, can we go back to that uh, justifiable like i actually really like that um i like i like that you're they're using that qualifier um, can you describe for me, um, in the, in the specific instance of bringing a, a, someone into existence, um, how you can consider that justifiable and well, then can you go back and then talk about, uh, cause we could talk about justifiable in terms of somebody who already exists, who already has interests, who already, who has mm-hmm. a, a need to be prevented from further harm. Which right. is far easier, which is far easier to speak of, um, right. which and I think the asymmetry argument no shows. Interest or... uh, I think the asymmetry argument shows how, how much easier in, the, in that respect, because it's, it's far easier to create a, was it a, um, you know, a, um, a comparison in which we're, if we need another individual, we need, a, we need to see someone with that subjectivity before we can uh, express that, like, though this is this is better or worse because of um, like, how do you even know? Like, what 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 is the measure, the gauge, the standard? Um, so it is a lot easier when you when you put a subject into it. So w- the the question is essentially is uh, what would be an, a justifiable um, justifiable uh, risk of harm to impose upon another in the specific instance of having um, a child? So you're risking, for example. Uh, horrible diseases and death you're also risking um nihilistic uh meaningless existence which arguably is worse and you're also risking like any other kind of phenomenological negativity that that individual can experience and then on the opposite you are also hopefully um uh instantiating uh, the possibility of um of pleasure well-being uh, happiness, uh, meaningfulness, uh, the greater good of society versus the greater negative of society. So, you know, a very easy question to answer. Should take us a few minutes. Uh, <laughs> um, I think that um, I'm obviously I'm, I'm joking in case, in yeah. case I was there. Um, I think that was a bit of sarcasm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that when it comes to, I think it's always going to double back to that question on rationality and what, which is the rational position to hold. Um, I think intuitively uh, it's it's easier to answer um i'd say in terms of what i what i would say uh, and i would probably take um it's what heraclitus says i would say that i think that there'll be two things i consider in, in, in and i think you put quite well before natural evil and uh, artificial evil uh, like natural positive uh, natural uh, negatives and artificial positive uh, negatives and vice versa um do I think that my child will be, you know, birthed with any health conditions or anything that would cause innate, her- innate suffering, you know, even imp- imp- impede their rationality, their ability to live a good life? Um, I think that's the first thing that you have to consider and the likelihood of that. Um, to what degree, I think, is where the rationality is, uh, comes into. So, like, um, is there a 50% chance, 25% chance, 10% chance, 1% chance, and so on? And I think that for the most part, healthy individuals are not going to be born with debilitating health conditions. So you go and see a doctor, you find out whether it's justifiable or not. Fair enough. But that's, that's really the most basic, I think, of the, of the problems. Because then if you, as soon as you move on to existential issues, then you have uh, issues of education, of societal, um, of, uh, societal well-being. If you look at everyone around you, they're not doing okay. Why are they not doing okay? Is it something to do with your society? Well, most likely. So your institutions, um, your culture. So like the ethics of your culture and the, the, the way in which it's progressing even. So if you're seeing a culture that's in a state of degradation, um, it's very likely that the child may experience something that is worse, arguably, than what it, they would experience if they were born at the same time as you. 
So someone born in the 1970s coming into the economy of the 70s might have been okay, but the person that's having the child in the 90s watching the economy slowly deteriorate would see that there is a, a difference in what they're going to be birthing their children into. And even in terms of institutions and reasons, uh, people become more hedonistic, people were becoming more consumeristic and, um, you know, the, 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 that entailed problems of, of the, whether they're living a meaningful life. So all of these things considered, I'd say that you can then place, you know, these um, potential negatives against potential positives. I'll be birthing my kid into a place where they've got great education. Um, I live in a very moral culture, something that places ethics at a high level, which creates the likelihood that they may live a meaningful life. We teach philosophy, they may learn existentialism. Um, the, uh, and with other things to be considered, like in terms of um, those around them, the, the people we live in a critical culture that are able to question their beliefs and we don't, you know, and, and so on. Uh, these are all things that need to be considered. And so I think the natural problem, I think, is just that. You, you consider whether or not the likelihood that your child will suffer based upon their genes and their um, natural dispositions or the natural disposition of you and the other parent producing a child. And then if that is, it's unlikely, we'll say unlikely, like at least less than a certain percentile versus the, the harm that it could be. So if it's like a 1% chance that they're going to be born absolutely, um, like they're, they're going to be born like inside out and die five seconds later, you might think that maybe that 1% chance isn't worth it, which is why it's a risk reward ratio. So, but if there's like a 90% chance they'll be born with something like, I don't know, mild asthma, <laughs> that mightn't be so bad. Um, so deliberate over those issues um, accordingly. And then I would say with the existential problem, I'd reply with Heraclitus. And I would say that um, when he was asked, how would we, I think it was Heraclitus, how would you give a man, what would you give, what would you do to make a good man? Uh, and he says, uh, give them a good state. And I would say that uh, the culture, the environment you live in should be examined and see whether it's producing happy people, people living meaningful lives, and whether it's progressing in the form of a narrative where people are becoming more educated, more, um, you know, um, more uh, cooperative, more ethical, and overall uh, we're progressing in sciences and whatever it may be, that metrics that we use. And in which case, if we are, then you are justified again in having a child. I think the issue is, is that when you start getting into specifics, there can almost be an insurmountable amount of variables. And I think that, that we'll all have to admit that. Like, there is an ambiguity where there could be, there's a chance that they could be born into stardom, you know, and that actually be a problem. <laughs> or they could be born, um, you know, poor and become the next mother, Teresa. So there's, there's oh. so much to encompass with the human life. We can't predict exactly we can say whether or not you think that the likelihood of a person living a good life in that state and with that biology is probable or not. And I think that is how I would say whether you should or should not have a child. Very long winded, but I hope it expressed <laughs> me a uh, position. No, no, no. Yeah. I, I, th I think I, I get where you're going with that. Um, you know, obviously like I, I disagree. Um, I think that whatever the most meaningful thing in a life can be, I think it has to do with reducing suffering, helping other people. Mm. And if you're perpetuating that cycle, then you're kind of working against meaning. But that's just my personal opinion on it. Um, Mark, we say that uh, again, because I just, could you say that last bit again? Because I just managed to knock that off and I'm trying to get this stupid piece of stuff. Oh, no, yeah. Um, Basically, I think the most meaningful life that you can have is to reduce suffering for people, increase their well-being by reducing their suffering and giving them opportunities to uh, produce their own meaning, things like that. Um, why would you say it's? Why would you say the most meaningful thing you can do is reduce suffering? Um, because I think, like, kind of goes back to the value asymmetry. Like, I think that that's the most pressing issue for people. And then once they're free of that, then we, they can be free to follow their own meaning, free to follow their own well-being, basically. I don't think it's that, you know. Like, I would say that, like, one, I would say that, like, um, I'll take the Nietzschean stance and, like, um, humans do not have a problem with suffering. They have a problem with meaningless suffering. Um, 
Right, but but the suffering from um, lack of meaning is a, is just another type of suffering, right? <laughs> I, I I agree. I agree. That's right. a problem with the state versus a problem with nature, and but problem with nature, um, and and a problem with the psychology of the individual and how they uh, approach life. But the pro- I guess the point I'm trying to make is is that this kind of suffering is alleviated with ethics. Um, you say helping other people uh, avoid suffering. Um, it's it, I don't think it's about the suffering as much as it's about the freedom about the the subjectivity itself and their expression it's like when nietzsche like talks about the expression of um power he says like the the subject seeks to discharge its strength against the world um that's basically what i would say is actually happening like we seek to discharge our will against the world and except i think our will has an inherent telos uh, built into it and i think that's the aristotelian point uh, against Nietzsche. it's like well yeah we do but it's, it's it's actually towards like this benefit of uh, this relationship between good and bad and I think that means that an individual, though, can live a, a good life whilst suffering, like physical pain or uh, forms of anguish. So, like, um, you could, um, like, Nelson Mandela arguably lived a very good life, even though he was in prison for 30 years. Yeah, but, but what makes it good? That's my, that's my question. And me, would... and mine is because it, it has to do with the well-being of other people. Yeah, but I think if it's to do with the well-being of other people, which I agree with, it's not simply to do with suffering. It's to do with their expression of their subjectivity also. It's right. that we, I, I just that we are... Equivocate. I mean, I, I just think it's semantics at this point because, uh, because I feel like those things that you're talking about are just a type of suffering. <laughs> well, I think it's entailed. So I think like when like the difference is, is that like, if you say like it's to prevent suffering from an individual, then we're not taking in consideration. It's, it's asymmetrical. But if it's about the um, the expression of the individual subjectivity, which is what I think people inherently try to do, not necessarily seek positive or negative um, at, a, at a fundamental level. I think the, the baseline level is simply an expression of uh, self-determination. And then from that, we, from that, we are like, trying to seek this end telos like which is the ultimate expression of subjectivity which relates to the greatest like i think i think uh, a, a good way to put it right is um in gorgias socrates uh asks calices i think it is um whether the because he says well would you not rather be the tyrant and, and all that you know this tyrannical king that's you know going around torturing c- killing and doing whatever he wants he's unjust but he's um you know he's powerful is it not better to be powerful than just and he says you're not powerful if you're unjust, essentially. The, the point is, is that power is, is reflected in the, the good that you produce and in your ability to produce it. The, the wise person recognizes that the harmony within the individual is the reflection of their power, not the, um, like in, in the sense that they are acting with right reasons, not the necessarily the, the consequences of what they are doing which in relation to the world. It's not like how much do they change the world? It's how much do they change the world in a way that is good for them? So I think that we can both agree there that like there is a sense that when I try and seek something, I am seeking something. I'm seeking an end, a telos, a, a given goal, which is relation between pleasure and pain uh, and good and bad. But I would say that it entails both. And I think when you when you look at it when you and you look at it like as if it entails one and not the other, I think that is a mistake. And then that would that's what I would say would be the mistake of antinatalism. Yeah, I don't know. I just think I just think there's so much equivocation on like the good and the good life and and what's good. And well, there like, is problems with language there. I mean, like we could sit for hours, like right, right. Because like, like when someone says like, you know, uh, I think w- when people say the good or a good life or or whatever. I think what they're really saying is just not bad or getting over the bad or, or, or whatever. But, you know, you're starting to sound more sense. Buddhist now. You're starting to sound more Buddhist than, uh, right. Right. Well, uh, well, that, or even, I, or even ancient Greek. I think, um, uh, Socrates did say, uh, what is it? Uh, I think it was Socrates. He said, um, was it he who desires the least is like the gods. Right. Um, right. You know, and at this point, it's like, it's the reduction in desire. If you, if you desire the least amount of things, the desire itself is suffering. And therefore, you are actually feeling the least amount of suffering. And so you're in a state of um, apnea. 
so, yeah, so well, I, I, can, I definitely, I yeah, I mean, I definitely came about to antinatalism like via kind of like an interest in Buddhism, but um, I don't want to go too far into my own story there. But yeah, it's we could definitely talk about it for, for a long time. But I wanted to go back to Mark because we've been chatting for a while and wanted to see if he had any thoughts on anything we were talking about or any other questions. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, Mark. <laughs> uh, that's okay. The um... I guess the only thing I wanted to talk about was why, um, I guess, I guess, uh, my problem with Buddhism, I guess, would be an interesting one with relation to whether the we should commit to a Buddhist reduction of uh, desire for the sake of it reducing suffering, because it also reduces pleasure. So whether it, it essentially, I think, encompasses your position very well, in the sense that if we reduce desire, then we could see that the the, the end goal is to be desireless. And that, that's kind of like the Buddh Buddhist position, um, which is yeah, almost... Yeah, I don't, a, ascribe to a, I don't ascribe to a full, like, kind of traditional oh, position. I'm not saying you do, but I think <laughs> that the end of your philosophy would entail that. Because if you think that we should reduce suffering, uh, and no suffering justifies any given amount of pleasure, then we should try and... It's not to say that we should, you know, like, kill ourselves or anything like that, because Buddhists don't ascribe to that, uh, necessarily but that we should try and um, minimize our desires. Um, I mean, yeah, you're getting close to the idea. So, so the idea for me is that um, I, I like that you put justified in. That's fine. I like the qualifier, but um, I just don't, I, I, nobody's ever been able to demonstrate to me that like anything quote unquote good can ever justify that. It's, justify what I would consider morally relevant suffering, especially in terms of like our relationship with other people. So I think that's kind of where it is. I, I, I think that's where we would have to agree to disagree is because I think this nebulous idea of good, like to me, when I think about just like practical everyday life, like I, I just don't see it. I don't see how it could ever justify it. Yeah. Morally relevant suffering is suffering that is entailed between interpersonal uh, interaction uh that's what you take it as yeah right right and it could be just very simple kind of like harms like you know punching somebody in the face but it could also be very name more, more like you know higher order harms like you say like you know depriving somebody of of their liberty and you know all, some of those other higher order bads that you were talking about even expressing an ideology which ultimately causes an individual's liberty to be harmed in the first place so if you express a ideology let's say of um i don't know free market capitalism arguably if you're a socialist you might be you might be inhibited in the expression or not even if you're a socialist but let's say you were uh, let's say socialism was true and marx was right then you would be causing the psychological alienation of individuals implicitly by uh, endorsing that notion of free market capitalism and supporting it, which allows it to uh, subsist and continue. And arguably that alone is a, is a, is a cause of suffering from in, in, in a most, um, even, even in the most, uh, um, innate way, like you're not even, you, you, there is no way that you could have intended to cause that. And you might have even chose to be a capitalist, you know, right. like power in the words of Foucault power is everywhere. So you, you just be it by existing. You might have caused someone suffering in that respect, in an interpersonal way. Right, well, that's another, that's another interesting thing. Um, there's another philosopher who's an antinatalist that, the, the guy that I was uh, referencing in the video, Julio Cabrera, who actually argued against Benatar's, he talks about uh, what he calls the, uh, the moral impediment, where he, feel, he feels like just our very existence is, is basically a moral burden on other people, and there's no way around that. But that's kind of another interesting topic. It's to, interesting. See, I'd say, yeah. the, I'd say it's, a, I, I think that uh, the, uh, like it feel like like I think the problem is is that people expect liberty to feel good. Uh, they expect it to be uh, wow. I feel so liberated and free. And what they really mean is unrestricted. Um, you know, I nothing is imposing or getting in the way of what I want. Uh, whilst all the time they're actually being caused by something. So then we we'll call this in uh, uh, negative and positive freedom. Um, the one one aspect of positive freedom whilst they're not taking into consideration that, the, that they're actually not free because they're not, uh, that they're being caused by something else. I think, you know, they're, they're a free market capitalist. Mm -hmm. uh, they're freest when they're expressing their free market capitalism 
but they didn't choose to be a free market capitalist because they weren't rational about it. They were given it as a child or a Christian or whatever it may be, whatever ideology it is, and so cause um, problems there. In terms of the burden, though, I'd say that I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that there are free market capitalists out there. I'm, I'm, I would consider myself a socialist, um, an an anarcho-socialist for the most part, or an uh, anarcho-libertarian. Uh, that's probably where I'd close, closely align my politic, politics to. But that I don't think that we would have got even ideologically as developed in left-wing politics if it wasn't for the right wing. If it wasn't for people like Robert Nozick telling people like John Rawls why they're wrong, I don't think that we would be where we are. And I think that's, I think that's beautiful, man. I think that's great. I think that like, it's somewhat, uh, in the words of Heraclitus, all things come to pass through conflict. And I think that conflict and ethical uh, burdens can actually be a positive thing in some respect. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't disagree with you there. I don't disagree with you there. So um, I guess well, it, in terms of the, sorry, just, in, just to get back to the morally relevant harms versus morally relevant pleasures, I'm just wondering um, why you'd say that none of them necessarily entail, like, so for example, is there no instances of morally relevant, like, uh, pleasure, good, you know, positive experience that you could see as entailing or justifying a morally relevant harm. So, um, I think a good example, right. Let's say an ideology, um, could you have an ideology which was not perfectly true? And so will have an aspect of bad faith in it, which could cause existential crisis and tragedy. The, the individual will experience tragedy in their life at some point, but for the most part, they will experience um, they will experience um, harmony within themselves. They'll feel tranquil and, for the most part, a positive experience. Would that not? Uh, would that not like in a specific circumstance? Would you say that that ideology was good or bad? Yeah, I'm having trouble following you there, Lewis. <laughs> so, uh, so, so, like in the case you of like, it like I'm five, kind of. No, 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 no. It's uh, it's so. Like, let's say you've got an ideology, right? Um, let's say it's not a religious belief, but let's say um, I don't want to say a spiritual belief either. Let's just make it like um, an ethical disposition in the world. Okay, um, it's highly developed past our society. Okay. Uh, we're talking about like the future, they've, they've worked out how to really care for each other and are living lives in the best possible way they know how to. And it's, it's progressive in, in a sense that it's progressed beyond what we're capable of. But obviously it's still not true, right? Absolutely true. It's not, there's no uh, absolute epistemic certainty. They haven't reached truth and all of its glory. And so there are aspects of their life in which they will come to a moral dilemma and face tragedy. They will not know how to behave and that will cause um, that will cause them distress, anguish, right? Now, in that scenario, would you say that ideology, which they uh, have approached rationally, I'll, I'll say as well, they've adopted it from based on reason, um, would you say that the ideology was positive or negative? Was it, is it a good ideology? It answers most problems uh, accurately, and it doesn't answer a few, but that's because it's not perfect. Would you say it's good or would you say it was bad? Yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting thought experiment, <laughs> but um, it's, it definitely gets a lot more nebulous when, it's, when we're talking about just within one individual. And so like, that's why I like to relate it to, to interactions between people. Do you know what I mean? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I, I guess the reason I picked ideology in the first place because I think that it's like, it, it is a societal and uh, like, you know, like we don't pick, it's institutional. It, it, it's involved, like almost, it evolves uh, almost uh, in, in, in a closed uh, format, but within a set, subset of individuals, like it takes more than one individual to produce it. It's part of a language and a language game. Yeah, yeah I don't know. It's complicated because, because if, um, if intrinsic to that ideology that there's some untruthfulness or, or whatever within it that, that will be that will allow that society to be susceptible to harms. And yeah, of course, I don't think that's a good thing, even though. Right. Yeah. Even right. if it answers um, more than any other ideology before it and is, uh, you know, is closer to truth than ever have been, you would say that it's still, it's not good enough. So what would you say was good enough? Absolute certainty. Yeah. I, I think I would just have to say, I don't know, like in that particular instance, like I, I'm not used to uh, ruminating <laughs> on, on uh, 
those types of thought experience. experience. Oh, yeah. That's fair enough. That's fair enough. The reason I say that is just because it seems to me that like, cause I would say that would be kind of what would be necessary to prevent the individual from feeling, you know, the, the cold embrace of tragedy, you know, uh, within their life, which is a form of suffering, which I think is, um, which ethics seeks to resolve. Um, I think they're the problems of absurdity, but I think that the reason I, I, I gave that one is because I think that it, it entails a positive experience of inner social circumstances as well. So like uh, it is the value of ethics expressed in relation to the negatives of our experiences, uh, the in- inherent nature of being, of, uh, which is somewhat uh, naturally absurd uh, in which humans, if they're just operated individually are absurd creatures that they don't really come to rational uh deduce conclusions um so i was i was kind of trying to show that like in in many ways i think there is positives uh, morally uh relevant positives from inter-social relations as much as there is negatives and right. i think we're kind of in the situation again which entails like is this harm worth is this kind of harm worth this much you know good right and, and and are those positives actually quote unquote positives as in like going above a baseline or are those positives actually just better more efficient ways of preventing bad <laughs> see i would say i would say that uh, it's going above a baseline um i think that to assume it isn't uh, destroys the notion of a positive anyway so what you're really doing is you're saying that there isn't a positive experience there is a privation of negative uh, kind of like Augustine with uh, the notion of evil. He's like, there isn't evil. <laughs> there is just uh, the, the privation of good. Um, mm-hmm. And it's this, uh, as if it's a, in, in which case a, a positive would simply be a, a neutral state or a state from which there is the least amount of, of negative. And right. Then, and, I, and I don't, yeah, I don't, uh, no, I don't propose that. But, but I do believe that most of what people say when they say good it does fall back on that, do you know? What like I mean? a relief mechanism for the most part, right? Like, right. So um, you feel good when you when you drink water because it quenches your thirst. Are you feeling the value of the drinking as a pl- as a pleasure positive experience, or are you feeling the removal, the relief of the negative, which is the thirst and the dry throat, the pain? Yeah, and I and I would say both in in many cases. I would agree. I, I would say both. I would definitely yeah. say both. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I think, I I think like, that's, sorry. I was just going to say, I, I think the difference is, I think that that amount that goes over baseline is, uh, is so kind of much smaller and irrelevant compared to that other part uh, or other percentage, I guess you could say, of the quote unquote good. Mm. That, uh, and, and I don't think people realize that. <laughs> but, uh, but that's kind of the perspective I'm coming from. So like, even if we talk about the the goods, quote unquote, that can justify the bads, there's, I think we're basically splitting the goods in half. And so like, you're basically piling back on the bad. The bads, yeah. I see what you're saying. Uh, and don't get me wrong, I think I agree with a lot of things. Like, for example, I think even before you enter ethics, I think that we should all agree that the most fundamental thing that we need to do is provide for the basic needs of citizens and individuals who are ethical agents, because without that, they are incapable of being... Um, of being um, able to free themselves from the system of drives. I think uh, Hegel calls it so essentially like uh, from the basic needs, they will always choose the basic needs. They can't help it. Like you will choose water. You th- then like, if you need to steal water, stealing may be wrong. You are stealing that water <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and you're not wrong for doing it because you're trying to respect subjectivity and you're in a situation where the, um, ethical obligations of your culture no longer respect subjectivity. And so that's where you feel in tragedy. So unless you're, you're meeting the basic needs of individuals, you're going to find that they're not, you're not actually managing to hit an ethical uh, culture. You're not actually even in ethics yet because the people are starving. People are, are, uh, are in situations where the, the tragedy of their existence is overcoming. The, 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 the absurd, absurdity of their existence is overcoming uh, the reasons within their uh, institutional framework. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think that's I think that's very vitally important. So when you think like you know, like you know, if someone's thirsty, hungry, uh, you know, in need of shelter, uh, you need to sort those out first. And I think that there is a definite moral obligation to do so. And the pains of sorting them out, like the pain that you'll experience when they're unsatisfied, is 
very great. It is, it's, not, it's not something to be laughed at. It's something that needs to be appreciated with, uh, with, uh, gr- with uh, all, of its, uh, all of our faculties. We really need to like, remove people from the, from the worst scenarios uh, before we start thinking about, you know, like, uh, would we all like yachts? Uh, you know, how would it feel to, you know, live a life of a millionaire and, and, and do all these like frivolous things? We need to consider like the pain of someone starving to death in Africa or an animal getting its throat slit for a hamburger and, and so on. Um, in regards to whether there is a, a pleasure that entails some pain, I think that I think that's possible. I think the pleasures that I would say that do, um, I'd say once you've gotten past the baseline of relieving the, the most basic pains, um, I think that most pleasures from that point, like uh, there are two types in the sense that higher and lower, but I would say that it's almost um, one relates to, um, and I think they all relate to a base desires in the sense that they almost in some way relate to desire itself. Um, but the problem is, is that when we become fixated on certain desires, for example, let's say you become um, addicted to food, right? Which is totally possible in our situ- in our state many of us including myself struggle to not eat a lot of food <laughs> right. it's really tempting but it always causes we're suffering we'll get heart heart disease we're we you know we'll, we'll get diabetes whatever it is and and not just that like we'll also maybe feel ill and, and and incapable of looking after ourselves and we also feel empty because we are propagating desire to the point in which our desires are waxing and waning and growing and growing and growing whilst the pleasure is actually minimal to the point in which a Buddhist, I think, I think is right in saying that when you're eating whatever food you are, you will feel the distaste of knowing it's going to come to an end. And, and in which case you're actually at that point, just medicating yourself. You are taking physical p- pleasure to get rid of the, of the psychological distress of not having that pleasure. You're addicted. Uh, and I think that, that, that is a problem. <laughs> I think that is a big problem of society. Uh, you need to remove those uh, pleasures, essentially. You need to minimize them. You shouldn't be uh, eating for the sake of uh, enjoyment all of the time. You should be eating for the sake of health and well-being most of the time and then maybe celebrating or something, whatever we decide is the rational kind of balance there. And then I think that we've got another type of pleasure, which is um, like uh, more intellectual and I think that uh, an ethical. So like um, considering other individuals, um, helping others, altruistic joy. Buddhists actually encourage altruistic joy for the most part, because I would argue for its relation between pleasure and pain. Altruistic joy brings more pleasure to not only a greater individuals, but to the individual themselves, because Hegel even sees it like this, right? When we, when we desire an object, right? Like if we desire like, uh, let's say I desire like this kind of pop, right? Um, once I obtain the kind of pop, it's not an object anymore. It's actually part of me. It's part of my subjectivity. I've then sold it. It is mine. It is my property. Therefore, I can't desire it anymore because I already have it. So my desire starts to, to cease of that object and it continues onto the next object, the next kind of pop, the next bottle of pop, whatever it may be, or it might express itself in a new different way, sublimated somehow. However, if I desire another person and their well-being, I cannot, because of the way that an individual is, and, and uh, I understand them in a relationship, if I, if I want a relationship with an individual, I can never obtain them. If I did, I would destroy them and destroy the relationship itself. And so within a relationship, you have this opportunity to have a constantly expressed desire whilst it doesn't propagate onto another individual because then you would be using someone like if you're obviously if you're sleeping around and you see someone as a means to a end of sexual gratification you might desire one person then you might desire the next person then you might desire the next person but if you want a meaningful relationship with someone you'll see that it is a uh, that it, it has to be a mutual understanding of you have to come to understand that individual and that understanding is that what is being fulfilled you are seeking to know the individual, to respect them, to, to gain greater insight into them, but you'll never actually destroy them in any way. There is no like loss. And that desire doesn't, you'll never feel that bitterness as you will when you, when you bite the bar of chocolate, when it's running out or drinking the can of pop, because the, it, it will never leave. It's, it's something that will stay with you throughout your life. It's, it's an ending. And in that, the gratification, I think, becomes greater and greater because 
the relationship can only become greater and greater. There is an almost an infinitesimal amount of, um, of circumstances you can have with another mind because the mind itself is so unknowable by you. There is an inherent uh, inability to become uh, a single unified notion of self. And so that, that relationship is unending. It's, it's infinitely propagating. And, and I think that those kind of desires are what we should be seeking, like uh, ethical ones, ones that were relationships, uh, even desires for, for knowledge. I think that is another, it's intersocial and it's not as direct as something like a love and relationship, but it's intersocial and it relates to reality itself. And I think that is also an unending pursuit of something that is never going to cause you any harm. Like you, you don't necessarily feel harmed by, you know, increasing your love of whatever language you're trying to learn or um, whatever knowledge you're trying to, you know, progress in philosophy, mathematics, sciences. And these are the kind of things that once we beat, beat the baseline pleasures, seek relationships, meaningful relationships, and seek uh, intellectual uh, engagement. And I think that those are kind, they, they are different in the sense that they are metaphysically different. And that metaphysics relates to how you can actually end up enjoying your life. Because otherwise, you're going to, you're going to feel um, uh, the, the emptiness of hedonism. Wow, that was great. No, <laughs> um, very romantic, by the way. Oh, th uh, thanks, man. I, I do continental philosophy. This is, I know you do, you do analytic. Like, uh, honestly, man, you, you actually sound so much uh, more, like well, well structured. <laughs> like, your points are just like so clear flow and mine are like, but what does it mean? <laughs> no, 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 it's good. It's good to have that. Like, um, I think more people would be interested in philosophy if they had, uh, they had that kind of more continental approach almost. I think, I think the good, the goodness exists somewhere between uh, the fields. I think we need to be sometimes like you read someone like Kierkegaard and you're like, what the hell is he doing? <laughs> right. Like, but no, no, there's still value there. It's just, for me, it's just not my style. So it's just hard. Yeah. To uh, as well, I think as well, the different educational formats, isn't it? Like, so if one person's better than one and one person's better than the other, then they should pursue them. I think the one thing that we need to propagate is really just communication between the fields. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that's that thing. That's just problem. Like, like for example, free will is approached very differently in continental philosophy as it is in analytic philosophy, and I think that the, the there is a, there is a, there is a divide there. And I think that some continental philosophers read analytic philosophy, and you get some analytics that read continental philosophy, but it's just not the majority, and it really should be. Right, right, definitely. Yeah, no, I like what you were saying. Um, I definitely think those are probably the most quote unquote like pleasurable or, or are the best things about life um and to me and i was actually thinking about that i guess yesterday just because it was like the whole like uh, valentine's day thing um and i was just thinking about some of the people i interact with and how they have uh essentially no possible way of interacting with people i mean no no possible i would say yes it, it's like waxing and waning but um basically they're, they're unable to have a meaningful intimate relationship and how that's essentially just a tragedy in my opinion. Oh, absolutely. I completely agree. I think that the, you hit the word on the head with tragedy. Um, and I think that's an, a feeling of the ideology that they've been raised in. Um, they've been raised to not approach individuals as equal moral agents. And they've not saw that the, that they should be desiring certain obligations, but instead the desire uh, experiences and those experiences use people as a means to an end and that's why ethics i think is better understood as as not a selfless endeavor but as a or, or a selfish endeavor but as a mutual advantage uh, was it a was it a i think when the words of john walls what does he say a venture of mutual cooperation uh it, it's almost as it, it's for the greater good of us both uh, it's about the we and the rather than the i and I think like the pe people really like, especially in our culture, like we're just, it's not, I, it's not even like people who are just nasty people Then they're, they're not like, they're just like, we're just confused. A lot of what are just confused. And I think that's just nihilism has really taken hold of people in our culture. You, you'll never find an unhappier person than someone like on the Wolf of Wall Street, you know, when he's just sniffing loads of drugs, you know, mm -hmm. sleeping with loads of women and spending as much money as possible. I wouldn't wish that life upon my enemy. I right. think that's how bad that life is. Yeah, no, yeah. I completely agree with you there. Yeah, and it, and it's not just that. I, I I guess it wasn't the wasn't just the fact that it was the the people who aren't who can't see it, but it's the people who 
it's not even a possibility for them because of their faculties. Mm, like or like as in the mental faculties, as in like how like if they're disabled, for example. Or... Right, right. Just from my perspective, that's what I was pondering about. You know, right. Because you, you were saying you worked with them, yeah. I thought you meant like just in general, like when you walk around, like I'm not going to lie, like I, I see it anyway, like uh, people yeah, no, just no. like, you know, consume. That's also, yeah, that's also tragic. It's tragic in a different way. No, no, I think, yeah, but and one is almost naturally occurring and one is artificial. One doesn't have to and one does. I think the, I think the natural case, I think that is, it is really horrible when you see someone who is severely disabled um, and then they're unable to live, a, 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 have those kind of meaningful relationships. I think that is a problem. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I don't have a solution for it necessarily. I do hope that there is one day that would do, you know, whether it's, you know, helping prevent these disorders or cure them um, or even, you know, finding a way to communicate with individuals. Because I think until recently, even like there was that whole trapped in syndrome kind of uh, problem <laughs> where people weren't able to like even communicate. Now we can like communicate with eye movements and stuff like that. And that, I think that that alone makes such a big difference. Right, right, yeah, that locked in syndrome, yeah, yeah, it's uh, yeah, locked in syndrome, yeah, it's a uh, horrible, horrible, truly. Uh, I, I do think that I would probably, I, I know that in, in it's a it's a perhaps uh, we can debate whether I'm rational for wanting it or not, but I think I would rather die, <laughs> uh, absolutely. Uh, no, I, I don't think that, like, uh, if, you, if you're in a situation where you're just trapped with your own thoughts, um, mm -hmm. till your death, I, I don't think that you're gonna live a good life, I, I don't. I think you're yeah. just going to feel constantly frustrated. And that's the thing, like, I think that's the thing that bothers me the most and kind of why I, I don't waver uh, from my antinatalism is because I could, I can kind of see, I can kind of grasp it when I see people talk about, about the good that justifies it. But I would have to be almost certain that my potential child would be able to experience those things. Mm -hmm. And it, if I wasn't guaranteed that they couldn't experience the good things that may come slightly close to justifying it, I feel like I would be doing such a huge disservice. To I, I completely agree. I think, I think you can um, certainly take that position. Um, as I said, like the, the, the level of where we draw the line is the, the point I think of contention. Yeah. Where, we're, where this is where we need to have the discussions here. Uh, like at what point are you rational for risking, you know, the potential harm of a child versus the potential uh, well-being. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's something that we do in ethics all the time. How many, how many people should you send to prison? How many innocent men should be, or, or women, should be sent to prison uh, to prevent uh, convicts from getting out free and getting off and, and being allowed to subsist within society? And there's always that ratio where there will be a certain amount of people that get convicted on a certain amount of evidence because we cannot rely upon epistemic certainty because if we were then no one would go to prison so is that there's always that like at what point is it justifiable to send someone to prison is it not justifiable to send someone to prison um and as you say like if you're giving someone let's say like life imprisonment you ought to be damn sure uh you know that you're convicting the right person um but i think the, the in that in that scenario I, I think there is times when i think that there is like it is justifiable to send like i think there was a, a man who once said um I can't remember he was a he was a, definitely a lawyer um but he said better to send what is it better a thousand guilty men go free than one innocent man go to prison if you apply this to the anti-natalist position it's like better the a thousand good births are prevented than one bad birth occur right um and uh, you can definitely see the rationality in that. Like, it, it seems that like one bad birth might be so utterly um, detrimental to the understanding of what we are trying to respect in subjectivity that you you may actually, it might be better for a thousand people not to be born because it's just that this person will feel like the their inter their vital interests will be um, stamped on every day of their life. You know. Um, I think the other point there, Lewis, is like, is it ever bad? to prevent a good life from being born is that actually is that ever a bad thing you see this is the thing it's like are you wrong for preventing a good life um that was actually one of my questions so thank you <laughs> oh yeah, yeah um i think that like when we, when we look at it like this i do agree that like it, it's related to the individual um obviously but it's not like if we were to say in a bubble like so we're not just like saying like because we could also come into the um we're not going to include things like uh, birth rates, death rates, um, environmental 
you know, catastrophes and blah, blah, blah. Someone living a good life versus, you know, also causing like, I don't know, you know, that, that breathing causes some sort of butterfly effect that causes a hurricane to hit the coast of Australia and thousands of people die. You know, like there is like silly, like uh, a numerous amounts of things that could be considered when we talk about um, whether the life was justified. But if we just talk about like in that bubble, in the act itself, is it, is it okay to prevent a good life from being born? Someone that would experience happiness. Um, only as much as it's justifiable to cause harm. And I'd say that must relate to um, other individuals. So if it was not going to affect anyone else, then yes, you would be wrong. In, pre- in preventing that life uh, you you would be wrong in preventing the happiness and the well-being of that individual um and the expression of subjectivity simplest that's what you'd be inhibiting because it would be creating a, a greater expression epistemically of subjectivity and i would say that would be wrong um however if you were to say that like um having that child will cause me distress i will no longer i will have to be a father um that might inhibit my subjectivity or you might say that um uh, you know, it will cause suffering to someone else. Uh, then, then it becomes more complex. But I, I think that preventing preventing well being is a, is wrong, uh, is is as wrong as causing harm. Well, I think preventing well being for people who already exist is wrong. No, I mean in general, like absolutely, I'd say that like preventing the expression of subjectivity to to a greater degree is wrong, and uh, preventing and uh, causing the inhibition of subjectivity is also wrong. So if you were to have a child that would live a life of suffering, let's say you're inhibiting the expression of of subjectivity. If you're having a child that lived a good life, you are preventing um, the expression of subjectivity. That doesn't mean as well, like, as I say, does not mean that we should all go out and have as many children as possible. It means that we should take into consideration what best reflects that expression of subjectivity which includes things like the environmental impacts, it includes the economic impacts, it includes how it affects me, my family, those around me, and the institutions of our society. It includes like births and death rates. It includes a, a plethora of, of, my, of minutiae and desidera that like, um, desidera, uh, minutiae that like need to be considered. And I think that's, that, I think that's really the, the issue here. Like people are not considering whether they should have children. Yeah, I'm trying to get my mind around, around that. So preventing... Preventing a life of what? It, how do you phrase it? Subjectivity. Preventing subjectivity itself. So I wouldn't say like a life of subjectivity. So like, I think like obviously the subjectivity of an agent is, um, subjectivity of an agent is. I don't know. Like I think that like would it be wrong? I mean like if you wanted to have children, because like I think like you shouldn't. You're not morally obligated to have children because then that would obviously impede your subjectivity in the first place do you you see what i mean because you would be then determined that you must act in a certain way otherwise you are being uh, unjustified but in no way must you act in that way because there it would not necessarily change uh the subjectivity um i think it only this this consideration must only come into question if someone is deliberating on having a child or not um, if if they don't want a child, and they like they never wanted a child, and like it is, it's not something that would ref- reflect the their well being or the well being of them around them. That there is no purpose of them having a child. They do they do not desire it at all. Then they should not have a child. I think that would be almost imposed upon them. It would be uh, forced, and that would re- problem that would be a problem with subjectivity. But then if they do want a child, right? Like, let's say they have that desire, but they aren't sure whether it is right or wrong. At that point preventing a good life would be worse than um preventing a good life would be bad as would be causing an unhappy life if you understand me so once in the ethical dilemma once in the decision making process of whether they are going to or not going to have a child then i would say that the 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 weighing up of potentiality is is related to the subjectivity simpliciter but until that point like it 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 reflects who's around now. Hmm. Mark, do you have any questions on that? Because it, it almost seems like you're, you're giving subjectivity some kind of intrinsic value. I, I think uh, subjectivity is probably what I would say. 
is intrinsically valuable in the sense that its expression is inherently valuable. Even, um, I think even Sartre sees that, like the, the idea of like inauthentic versus an authentic life. Um, and like, people think he's a nihilist, but he's, like, he's not even a nihilist. He, he thinks that there is a, you should live the authentic life and you shouldn't live the inauthentic life. Uh, I think that subjectivity itself is, is, is it's inherent. It's something that we cannot help but, uh, but feel. It is, a, it is a desire, an ongoing process from which seeks uh, a given ends. And in that, it, it is the evaluation in the world which creates value. Right, but only for people who exist. I mean, <laughs> so... Yeah, yeah, it is. But like, I mean, like if you're deliberating on whether this potential individual, so it, you, once you've created the thought experiment of whether you are going to have a child or not, would you, uh, are you justified uh, in saying that you are, that you shouldn't have a child uh, even though you want a child? Uh, it's not going to, so it's to just imagine, right? So there is nobody else's subjectivity being impaired in this. It is purely, do, uh, do you want a child? You, you're like, well, maybe. It depends. Is it rational? That's what I want to know. So mm -hmm. it would be rational for you to have a child in that scenario. You would be, you would be, you wouldn't be obligated to have the child because if you were obligated to have the child, your subjectivity wouldn't be respected. But if you, um, but towards that child, your obligations towards that child, if you do want a child or don't want a child, I'd say it would make, it would be more rational to have the child than to not have the child. Do but that's the subjectivity of the parents I'm, we're, we're kind of like talking no no about i mean the subjectivity of the potential being like because uh, uh, if you take the parents you have to i'm thinking if we're trying to dismiss everyone but the being itself uh which is quite hard <laughs> um, right. then i think no that, that's the, I, mean, I mean that's the thing there's no reference there's no yeah there's but if no, there's no reference then we can't do them harm either but i think we can judge whether we are going to bring them into something uh negative or positive and i think that's the if we're, if we're talking about the potentiality of a being and we're referencing uh, the multiple possible worlds and the, sim uh, what, you know, um, the asymmetry argument becoming the symmetry argument and like the, it just becomes another expression of moral logic applied to an ethical uh, dilemma, then we can express that there is a right and a wrong related to the probabilities of uh, a good and a bad occurrence in respect to the subjectivity of the potential agent. Yeah, yeah, right. But yeah. It's confusing because because the referent becomes the existent being once it comes into existence. So that mm -hmm. that's how you can say that it's harm. Whereas you can't say that it's harmful if it never comes into a being because there's never a referent. So yeah, same with that. The with the positive, it's um, once it comes into being, you can find you, you are referenced against whether it was a positive or negative, and whether that you were in hindsight justified. Obviously, hindsight being the golden uh, evaluator of our actions, and you know. Uh, reason is historical in the words of uh, Gadamer. Uh, and so it gives us more information from which to work out whether we were or were not justified, whether we, if we could have known the information that we have now, would we, would we have acted in such a way? Um, unfortunately, I don't think we'll have in that. The that. Yeah. In the absence of that hindsight perspective, there, there, there's still, there's still no reference in terms to be, to say that it's wrong to prevent that subjectivity from coming to existence. <laughs> Well, this is the thing. I don't think there's necessarily a wrong in preventing the subjectivity and a wrong in causing the subjectivity um, until you actually have that referential point of existence in which it's actually there. Um, and I think we can both agree with that. Like, that's the point of the, why you're saying the asymmetry argument failed because he required... Um, how do you say his name? Is it Benzar? Ben, uh, Benatar? Um, Benatar. Ben, Benatar. Benatar why his uh, argument failed is because he required that referential point of whether right. the, of, of that person in an alternative world who does exist. And that, that's kind of the cusp of the argument. It doesn't work unless there is a referent, referential point and go, that then uh, this, this is good or this is bad based on the existence of an actual agent. Uh, I think uh, um, a feminist philosopher even criticized, uh, criticized them for that as well. I think you mentioned, uh, was, it a, was it an Italian philosopher? Or was it, um, was a philosopher's name who I'd never heard before. Um, you did say, 
Well, the the one in the video, his name's Cabrera. He's a, he's from Brazil, but um, Cabrera. Okay, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I, I I wasn't. I knew I knew it was. Uh, I was thinking, is it Spanish? <laughs> um, <laughs> I knew it was a Latin. I knew it was a romantic language, but I was like, I I I'd never heard the name before. Um, right. Yeah. So I actually well, agree with him, and I say like you you do need a referent enabled to to make that claim, and so in the absence of a referent, there can never be a, a harm done by preventing it from coming to. <laughs> person into coming into existence so then we could agree that there you are under no obligation to have or to not have a child uh in uh, relation no. in relation to like you are not obligated to have children in all cases you are not obligated to not have children in all cases and instead the only only way that we can understand it is to create a possible agent uh multiple possible worlds of whether the agent will feel good or bad and in which case it's not, it's not, you are not only um, obligated towards the uh, pains an individual seeks, but the pleasures, because even, you, you know, you could have a, a child that feels more pleasures, or you could have a child that feels loads of pleasures. And these are to be considered, these are to be considered in the ethical deliberation. And in which case, then I would say that like, you, if you are purely respecting the subjectivity or the potential subjectivity of the agent and the life that they will live, then the greatest expression of that subjectivity is what would allow the justification of bringing them into the world that the expression of the subjectivity outweighs the inhibition of that subjectivity that the expression of that joy and happiness and well-being and is uh, outweighed by the uh, I mean, is is not outweighed by the the negatives and the harms that they that they bring in and the world itself uh, is reflected in the same way that the overall uh, good of the world is not inhibited by the overall bad of the world and and that's the kind of decision making process that we are uh, kind of entering in and i think that's just a typical ethical dilemma i don't right. think that's necessary it, it's so tricky but so to try to circumvent that I, I i kind of try to make it into like a decisional kind of outcome so it's like you make you have the parents you know they're kind of ambiguous and they're like okay let's think about it if I don't have the child, then there will never be a referent and that can never be bad. If I do have a child, there will be a referent and it can be either bad or good. And so it's, you know, and it would be a bad thing to produce a referent whose life is going to be bad. So in order mm -hmm. to prevent the, the wrongness or the harm from occurring, the, the bet, I guess it's kind of almost, I call that the, the wager. It's almost like a wager argument. It's like mm. you have a decision, you have these pot potential things. Uh, in order to prevent yourself from doing the, the wrong or making the wrong decision or causing harm, you should always divert to the decision not to have the child because there will never be a reverent. The that's reference. maximum reasoning. So it's like, yeah. That's right. Yeah, that's maximum reasoning. You maximize in your minimum. Right, absolutely. Bec but that, that also you can make an argument that if, the, if maximum reasoning is true, then antinatalism is true. That's fine. But then you're going to have to make that argument of why that rationality uh, supersedes others. Right, right. So, so yeah. you're going to have to base risk reward, whether it was worth the risk of producing a child which could feel harm versus worth the risk of producing a child that would feel positive. Right, right. And, that, and that's where I, I think that's kind of the, the crux of the argument between the two of us is that I don't see any justification. And so or I, I see that there's a, a possible potential justification, but I believe that um, it's, it's so unlikely and it's so difficult to achieve for most people that, that, that you cannot justify the risks. I mean, like you, you can also even say that like uh, the risks are not justified in contemporary society and that the society necessary to justify those risks is almost utopian. So you could say like uh, it would like we need a much better society, a much better healthcare system, a much better um, a means of cooperation, and you know maybe sort of cure diseases and a plethora of things before you think that the, the the risk is worth taking. Yeah, it's not just society. I would say like life itself would have to be yeah. fundamentally, uh, and that's the problem. Like it can I can think of a possible universe in which you know that would be the case, but in this universe, I don't. Yeah, I don't see that. See, what I would say is that we need to find out at what point it is a justifiable risk to take and how, what we are risking. So again, like, like uh, 
it is, it, I think fundamentally, we should tackle those most important, um, those most important uh, pains to be removed, like the necessities of life. And then we should encourage as well, um, you know, the appreciation of ethics and existential, uh, existentialism in, in this respect, philosophy, and try and live uh, lives which are good and not bad. Uh, to the to the point in which we, we seek higher pleasures and not lower pleasures. Um, I think that you're not wrong in saying that uh, you know that, that we are taking a risk and that that risk may be unjustified. It's just I don't necessarily feel confident in saying it necessarily is unjustifiable, depending upon the rationality that the ag agent is in is uh, using. So, for example, it's like when Robert Nozick criticizes John Rawls, he says that we, we don't necessarily need to maximize the minimum, that an individual is not irrational for not trying to maximize the minimum. If, if I put a pound on the lottery, am I being irrational? Like, because I'm not maximizing the, the, the minimum. I'm gambling, let's say, a pound of my money, which is worth um, probably too much, actually, for me. But, <laughs> but uh <laughs> Let's say I'm 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 um I'm placing a pound on the on the lottery or two pound it is now I think, and it's it's worth something but it's not worth all that much, but the opportunity to win you know hundred million is I deem to be a rational endeavor you know I I think that I mean the lottery is definitely probably not the best choice but the the I, I think that the, the risk reward ratio is fair and so I endeavor to um risk that amount of money for the reward of hundred million. Um, am I irrational for doing that? And I think that's the kind of thing that we need to work out here. Are, are we irrational for having a child, uh, risking the possibility of suffering, whatever form it may come in, because there's multiple, multiple types of suffering, as we've said, um, versus the possibility of well-being and against each other as well we, so we make that decision on behalf of somebody else that's i think we can absolutely i think that it's uh i think that we would we, we do that all the time i, I don't think that there's any difference i don't think there's any difference in making the decision because the, the you can't the, the individual will be incapable of making the decisions they will not make the decision for a child um to yeah, but, not uh, put a fork in the plug socket i, I know that they're already back, around uh, i know they're, but i don't see the difference I, I don't necessarily see the difference if you talk about consent um if you were to say that they, we cannot respect the subjectivity of an individual in the sense that um, uh, I'm trying to express the great the potential agents, because we're both agreed that the only thing that we're respecting is potentiality of an agent. The actual agent does not exist. So, right. in the term, when it comes to actually choosing to have the child or not, the the only thing that we're doing is re, is respecting their potential subjectivity and their expression. It, it, I cannot respect an actual, because if I was respecting the actual, in which case I would say like they did not consent. Uh, their freedom is being inhibited, then then I would be um, then that would be making the whole thing immoral because I'm doing it without consent. I'm in inhibiting their freedom, and therefore, uh, it is an unjustified endeavor. It's unjustifiable. But instead, I'm acting to express the the potential agent's uh, subjectivity, or uh, in both cases, whether I have them or don't. And I think if that is the um, if that is the crux of the decision making process. I don't see how consent can, can be an issue because you cannot say that someone would not consent to maximize their own subjectivity. It would be, um, they'd be like, I, I do not consent for my ability to consent. <laughs> I do not consent for my ability to be a free, free agent. Yeah. Yeah. I see your point there. It's yeah. It's just, I, th I think we're kind of going to go around and around on that point. Um, so in your video, philosophical overview of antinatalism and common objections, um, well, I mean, in general, so you talked about anti-frustrationism, uh, with, I'm going to pronounce it wrong, Fingy, Fingy? Like Fega? Yeah, Fega, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, it was like Chiffron and Figgy. Um, you said, uh, you had things to talk, because that was resembling Gary's, uh, argument, amend him, about, uh, there's no need to create need from no need, I think, is the way of phrasing it um and you but but you didn't create a new video about that so what were your thoughts on that like are you in agreement disagreement what's your thoughts on it yeah i don't think i've actually thought much about this <laughs> okay. 
it must have been just like something that was kind of like uh, turning around in my head at the time. So yeah, unfortunately, I'm not going to have any anything very insightful to say about anti-frustrationism at the moment. So you're just like neutral, like you don't think it's a bad argument, right? I, I just don't agree with the, with the frustrationism in general. Like, um, yeah, I just, I just don't agree with that formulation of, eth of ethics in general. So. Okay. I think, I think the, the, the idea of it is quite um, appealing actually, because I um, mean, talk about frustration, talk about like, well, the frustration of subjectivity and the will, which is essentially the crux of my, <laughs> my argument. Yeah. So I would say that like, ultimately it depends on whether the frustration was greater than, um, than the expression of subjectivity. The, the individual, when we seek, well, ethics is about is the expression of will. And so when we seek to express the greatest amount of strength against the world in the words of Nietzsche, then if it is greater than it is lesser, then you, you've done the subject a, a benefit, a, a good. Um, if you're to say that they, they live in, they will now have frustrations uh, and liberties and that those frustrations are not justified, then I would say, then why are you, if, if you are respect, you respect subjectivity itself, you don't respect just simply a negative experience. And that it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's just a repositioning of an asymm asymmetrical argument uh, yeah. where it's trying to consider um, a negative in another form uh, without right. considering the positive. I guess, yeah, I, I guess I just disagree with the, with the whole idea that like subjectivity is, is, the, is what's reducible. Like what's, that's the like fundamental value. I think, I just think anti-frustrationism is just incorporating a type, a type of suffering, a type of harm. I just think it's a type, you know, a specific type of harm, and and that's not the actual fundamental value that we're concerned about in ethics. So I think that's kind of like why I didn't really go with it because, you know, it actually sounds like it is more closer to your view, Lewis, than mine because uh, mm. it sounds like you, you know, there's the subjectivity there that has like some kind of intrinsic value, whereas I don't. So I think mm. that's the. Mark. I think like, when I say subjectivity has intrinsic value, I'd say it's because it's subjectivity from which evaluates the world, isn't it? Like, um, but you know, like, I, I don't think there's necessarily a problem because I think we'll both disagree with it. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, just um, for very different reasons. So I think that I think that shows you that, that um, like, if someone who if I hold a very similar position and I can disagree with it, it shows that maybe his internal critique, um, yeah, his is external critique, <laughs> and and therefore like. It might it mightn't have worked anyway, so it's definitely maybe I could probably do with researching it more. Like I'm sure that obviously there's there's more depth to it than what I've heard in the last like thirty seconds. But you know, yeah, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm not, not expert, but for sure. But in first impression, I'd I'd reject it. But that's is, just like a first impression. Is Ken Coates uh, an anti frustrationist? You know, I don't know. I don't know, you know, and he's passed away since he wrote his book. Have you read uh, his book? I, I have. It um, It doesn't use a lot of formal philosophy. It's, okay. it's a, just kind of intuition type thought experiments and, and discussion of, of uh, kind of common values and politics and things. But um, But no, I don't believe he would, yeah, from what I read, I don't think he would be considered an anti-frustrationist. Okay. The um, there's two things. Uh, well, I'll go on to the pinprick objection because that gets brought up a lot. Um, your counter argument to the pinprick objection is the threshold principle, right? Yes, the very nebulous threshold. <laughs> that uh, so, so my question was, how do you know the threshold? That that's a great question, <laughs> yeah. That's a good question, and I and I think that question, the threshold, changes depending depending upon the subject, really. Yeah. Okay. So is that, is that like pain threshold, or just kind like of, the value of, of the experience itself? Yeah, kind of like not necessarily pain threshold, but the suffering threshold, I guess you could mm -hmm. say. I think that the most rational position to hold on that would be to assume that humans uh, do have uh, an ontologically common uh, experience. Uh, that you are the same as me, and that you're in your subject, and that we also have uh, that ontologically considerable features like our ability to feel pain and pleasure, blah blah blah, mm -hmm. um, and that these can be related. So, for example, I can say you shouldn't smoke because it's going to cause cancer. You're really not going to like cancer. It's rational for me to say that because it's likely that your suffering will be as such that cancer will be a negative for you. Um, I, I would say that the only way that you could gauge it would be to um, to gauge the the median, the mean. 
kind of suffering and threshold that individuals face. And then to, from that point, investigate outliers, explain why, and constantly engage with the ontology of man. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a good way of explaining it. There's like, there's things we have in common, and yet there are those outliers where a pinprick would actually be a morally relevant suffering because of their particular circumstances of their subjectivity. So, so yeah, it, it's, 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 like, it's, it's always hard, man. <laughs> I mean, the mean would be, the mean would be important in terms of like creating like policy level uh, things. Uh, but uh, other than that, yeah, it, it, it does get pretty complex. The uh, pinprick Mark, objection. Uh, Sorry, go ahead. I was saying that, I know that's not a very like satisfying answer. That's okay. <laughs> Um, the pinprick objections usually in the realm of like uh, critiquing negative utilitarianism. Lewis, you you don't agree with negative utilitarianism, correct? No, I'm not a utilitarian at all. Um, so, well, like I'm, within the whole anti-natalist community, I think there's, I'd say, seventy-five percent of people that are negative utilitarians, and then the others are like more deontological approach. So, for me, I know uh, VA, you you created a. a another school of thought within N NU called uh, ob like obligation, negative utilitarianism? Oh yeah, I was just playing with words with that. It's basically just like, a, yeah, it's like a deontology that's just derived from uh, negative utilitarian principles, basically. Well, I mean, so, like to be fair, like you could, you could definitely come to that conclusion. Like, I'm, like, obviously, well, what wrong. would be your objection to negative utilitarianism? Um, I think that utilitarianism in general creates a problem of rationality. Like, how do we greatest? Like, how how do we respect the greatest good for the greatest number, or the greatest, or you know, the, the minimize the greatest bad for the greatest number? How do we how do we implement that? I think that's a problem of rationality and reasons. And uh, when you when you allow someone to come to the conclusions individualistically, uh, you're inherently going to cause a problem of subjectivity where individuals are they're going to think they're right, but they're actually wrong, and uh, there's uh, they're acting uh, biasly. I think uh, also you, ethics doesn't consider just a single individual's action and that we exist in a um, we exist in a framework in which we create obligations and duties towards each other so that we can maximize the consequences. Um, I, I would say I'm a consequentialist in the sense that Hegel, he, he, Hegel, <laughs> uh, Hegel's a consequentialist um, whilst also kind of ob, uh, arguing for duty. Um, there's actually a paper well, he, by A talks about that too, right? Like there's, there's certain rules within it, right? Yeah. I mean, you could even, you can even relate it to like uh, rule, uth rule utilitarianism uh, yeah. or uh, threshold deontology. Uh, I think threshold deontology is probably closer to where I am. Uh, what about yourself? Uh, v? Um, yeah. Yeah. I think I'm, I'm pretty close to that, but um, I'm not super familiar with the term threshold deontology. So like essentially it's like um, a deontological structure in which seeks to reflect the consequences of a given scenario. Yeah. Um, but then if the obligations, the obligations break down when the consequences from what you are trying to respect essentially uh, contradict your actions. So if you're trying to respect individuals uh, and make sure that they live happy lives. Uh, and so you create a deontological structure that um, respects like, you know, a, a, prevents people from stealing but then people become uh, destitute and require food and so start to steal <laughs> yeah. they're, they're no longer obligated to not steal um because I the know there was a term for that yeah that's yeah, like... yeah that was um kind of actually kind of produced by wd ross i think he's actually a subjectivist weirdly enough um uh, and he says basically who do you have the greater obligation to if all things are equal your mother or a random stranger and he says your mother because then basically because they have an obligation to their mother, they have an obligation to their mother, and it kind of expands out, outwards. Yeah, no, well. that's great. No, thanks. Yeah, I didn't realize there was a term for that. So yeah, I would say that that is my view is more of a threshold deontologist, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, two more questions, and they're probably like big, but we'll see. Is death a harm? Like the, the critique of Epicurus' yes. view? Yes. Okay. Uh, I would say, do you want to answer? Uh, sorry. Uh, I can expand upon mine on, on oh, shoot. Yeah, uh, the, I can expand. your answer. All right, so I'd say death is a harm in the sense that um, when we are... No, sorry, like, VA, what's your answer on that? Sorry, yeah. <laughs> oh, I just say, like, my, my general view is death is a harm for the person is, while they're still alive, but the death death can't be a harm for a person who who's, who dies. <laughs> I agree there, I agree. I think you're not harmed after you're dead. 
because you're not here to be harmed. Uh, just kind of Epicurus's point, isn't it? Um, so you do not fear so God. You do not fear death. With Epicurus on that. Uh, you see, I, I'm, <laughs> I don't agree with Epicurus in one respect. I think he's right for saying do not uh, worry about death because when you're dead, you're not going to be here to worry about it, right? Um, there's no there's no negative experience of being dead. Um, the the negative the negative is incurred when we are making decisions on whether to kill or not, or whether to take an action which affects um, the projection of occurrences of uh, future uh, outcomes, where we could say that, like, for example, in one possible world, um, you are alive, and in another possible world, you are dead. We may conclude that the difference between the worlds is what gives us the information to say that it would be better if you had lived or better if you had died, better to be dead than in excruciating agony and then hence euthanasia, better to be alive um, if you're going to live a happy life and experience the greatest expression of your subjectivity. So, so Epicurus is right in the sense that once, you, once you're dead, it's not a problem. But when we are considering death um, and how it affects each individual, we should remember that death is primarily an inhibitation of that subject and their subjectivity. So it must take into consideration their expression of their subjectivity as being, will it be expressed in a positive account or in a negative account? And in which case, should we, you know, do, should we harm people? Should we kill them? Should we not? Um, should we, should we kill them? Is it a harm? Should we kill them? Is it a, is it a good? Euthanasia may be a good, you know, murder may be a harm. And that's, that's kind of how we need to consider it. What do you think, VA? Yeah, in a roundabout way, I think, yeah, we're, we're basically in agreement with that. Um, of course, like it, going back to that whole idea, like sub subjectivity. Yeah, I, I'm still, yeah, I'm still kind of wishy-washy on that. But uh, it, it basically what, it just comes back to what I, what I already said. Death is a harm for the individual who is living for many different reasons. Um, death can be harm to others, um, but death for the individual, yeah. It, before they're dead, it's a harm. After they're dead, it's not. <laughs> I mean, that's... Yeah. Yeah, you I mean you can even say like the the idea of death is 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 a harm. So like you can say that you, the idea of like uh, if you are projecting your own life outward, then it's a harm. And some people try to make this point on animals. I'll say like uh, I think Magnus tries to make this point on animals. Where he says an animal cannot see its future because it's not dialog. It has it hasn't got like a, a temporal sense because it lacks language. Quite a clever, um, quite a, quite a clever little move. It actually tries to make. So if you were to commit a painless death, it could not have had an interest in staying alive because it it was not projecting its interests outward. Uh, my response would be that when we are considering how we ought to behave and how we are a respecting individual, we do not respect the concepts they hold within their minds of themselves, but we respect the individual themselves and our concepts of them within our decision-making process. We respect the potential agent uh, as being alive and dead in our judgments, not in their own. So just because an animal can't foresee life without their existence doesn't mean that life without their existence does not harm them in one way or another i'm um, not life without their yeah sorry existence without their life does not harm them in one way or another um va you're you're when people bring up uh whether or not if it's a bad thing to deprive people from coming into existence because of the goods um i think like in your video about the philosophical overview um, I, I would just want to ask, why don't we have an obligation to produce happiness? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, for one thing, the nature of subjectivity is such that, would, for one thing, we'd never be certain whether or not we are actually producing happiness or are suffering as somebody. Um, and another, another is, especially not uh de novo like creating happiness out of nothing um we have obviously i don't believe we have any obligation to do that um so are you saying do we have like an obligation to create happiness in people who already exist or are we talking about in the context of like creating a person uh i'd say both because like you, you, the critique about negative utilitarianism was that uh, even people that are here, uh, we have an obligation to reduce their suffering, but not necessarily to bring their happiness. Right. And I still don't understand how that works. Right. It's just because in my, like, in my opinion, like happiness is such like this weird nebulous idea that I, I don't even understand. I mean, 
have, you can talk about happiness in terms of, of uh, you know, fulfilling goals. You can talk about happiness in terms of, of like actual physical pleasure. Um, that is more of an intuitive argument. Um, but do we not do the same for pain? Is it not the same characterization of subject, subjective experience in which you can talk about the failure um, of it not achieving a goal or the physical suffering of you know, starvation? Yeah, th that's, that's a good point. There's some, there's some items there that I still haven't come to terms with in terms of um, the differences, like the moral differences between suffering and pleasure and happiness. Um, I think that the, the primary yeah. argument has to be that there isn't happiness. I think your negative utilitarians normally see that it's, it's a relief mechanism, for example, uh, most of the time. Um, yeah. or, or the happiness is just of a minuscule nature in comparison to the suffering that is occurring. So suffering is of a higher value. Uh, and, I think you, and I think suffering of a higher value in some respects, and for many type, types of suffering is true. I don't even think that wrong. <laughs> uh, I think Epicurus does point that out well. Um, yeah, that's closer to my opinion. It's just that um, I, I don't, you know, I do believe that, that morally relevant uh, pleasure and good actually exist. I just think it's, um, it's extremely difficult to achieve and it's trivial in comparison to the suffering. Mm. And, um, and obviously, just, you know my you know, my positions. <laughs> and and I, I definitely acknowledge the goods in life, but for me, it's about this uh, person affecting view that the deprivation of the goods isn't a, a bad thing for someone who doesn't exist. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's. But then, that, is the is the depri is the deprivation of the deprivation of harm is not a good thing for something that doesn't exist either. Right. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so I don't know how to square those. Well, two. The only thing that we can be respecting in my opinion is the potentiality of an agent who suffers or not. And I think that's just, I think that's the, the criticism of the asymmetry argument. And that's what I was trying to, I, I was trying to say to uh, superhuman dance, although I don't think superhuman dance is kind of no offense to the guy, but I don't think he's really, really thought much of it out um, when, when you kind of talk to him, he kind of just gets mad. So like this has been a much more fruitful conversation, I think, um, where I feel like we've actually explored together perhaps some of the more uh, minutiae of the situation. Um, I would like, if I mean, if anyone has an argument as to why we should consider the potential agent of, the, the agent's potential good whilst uh, bad sorry whilst not considering their good in relation to our moral responsibilities i'd love to hear that argument if they can really present why because it, it's something that does trip me up as well i, I don't see how it can be, how it so can be given. If benatar is still better never to have been um he did talk about how this is uh in the interest of the person correct uh va yeah in the interest of the potential person and yeah, yet the... commenters on that paper were saying it actually doesn't matter about the interests of the person. The prevention of the harms is what matters because that's good independent of a person. Right, right. And that's kind of my argument. It's, it's not... Well, Do you I, think you could... Sorry, no, sorry. No, so, so yeah. The way, the way, because it's so confusing when we're talking about non-existence and existence and reference, that's why I try to frame it in terms of like a choice and the consequences of those choices. So because I'm a deontologist, I believe that you can make moral choices and you have moral obligations. And so instead of saying that my, my decision to refrain or abstain from creating a child who will have a bad life, instead of saying that that's a good decision, I'm just saying that that's the moral decision. There's, I'm not saying that, that I'm doing something good for somebody. I'm just saying I'm making the moral decision as opposed to the immoral decision. Of it was the right thing to do. It was the right thing to do. Yeah. And, and yeah. I agree with that. That's how you should be doing ethics. You should be doing, is it the right thing to do? Not, not, right, is right. it? Yeah, I completely agree. That's the difference between threshold deontology and rule utilitarianism, I'd say. It's probably the appreciation of right. Um, so I don't know if that actually answered your question, Mark, but that's the, that, it gets so confusing when you get down in the weeds that that's how I try, I have to try to frame that for myself anyway. See, yeah. I'd, I'd say there's a risk of being a Kantian. What is the right thing to do if there's no agent? 
well, it's the right decision for, you know, the right thing to do as a, as a person for your own morality, basically your own, your own obligations, fulfilling your own moral obligations. Where would you obtain a duty if there wasn't multiple individuals from which to obtain a duty, to have a duty to? Yeah, that's a good question. That comes back to like, what's the purpose of ethics if there are no, you know, if like your decisions like end up with no people and there's no obligation. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'd, I'd say that ethics could not exist if there was not multiple individuals um, from from which to derive an obligation from. Like, um, I wouldn't even be able to work out, like even if I was to have an obligation to myself, um, which I, I think I would, I would be incapable of working it out because I would exist in a state of absurdity. And that only through interpersonal circumstances do I gain these obligations from which I can gain a notion of right. And so when we talk about, like, for, I think a good way to look at it is what is the good of the state without the good of the people? Okay. So if we're to say that, um, uh, you know, we do it for the good, uh, but that good does not, it relates to an agent. Mm-hmm. Well, then we're not doing it for the good because there is no good because the goods related to the agent. The good of the state is the good of the people and the good of the people is the good of the state. That's the idea that's supposed to be a kind of circularity, a hermeneutic understanding of the abstract universal concept applied to the individual particular uh, scenario. And this is the problem that Kant makes, where like Kant says, like, he talks about these abstract, um, almost a priori depri- uh, um, uh, notions, but then there's, it must have a reference point within humanity, within the nature of being. Because if it didn't, if it was purely rational, then it wouldn't work. And I think his own work kind of shows that. So you get people like Hegel come around and he says, well, what we're obligated to do is express subjectivity. Um, and in which case, the, you, you, the only way that you'll be able to determine whether something was right or wrong, the first thing you consider is like, is it right or wrong to bring an individual into the world reflecting the, subject, the subjects that are already here? And if it's not right or wrong, let's say it's morally ambiguous, um, then the, the next stage of consideration uh, is, is it right or wrong to bring this individual in the world? How will the world be different here if we had three possible worlds where the individual is brought into the world, the individual isn't brought into the world, uh, sorry, the individual is brought into the world and they're happy, the individual is brought into the world that are unhappy and the individual isn't brought in the world, which possible world is the greatest? And in which case, we're still reflecting subjectivity simpliciter, um, but that potential individual is then taken into consideration. And I think that's probably what we do. Uh, and I think that like, without respecting individuals, without respecting subjectivity itself, then you're just creating an ethical system from which doesn't correspond to reality and what I think Vico calls a perverse philosophy. Yeah. We should probably wrap up. And uh, just if you, either of you had any closing statements and then... Uh... Oh God, no, I think you've heard us talk enough, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, um, I actually really enjoyed the conversation. Um, Lewis, uh, it was really, it was really nice talking to you. I actually learned something about my own view today, <laughs> which is uh, awesome. I, I really appreciate it as well. Like, I, I feel like um, it wasn't until antinatalism kind of like started, like in coming more apparent, especially, um, that I even questioned whether it was right or wrong to have children. Uh, and then it just shows that like, there is things that we just do not question that are implicit beliefs. And you don't even think, like, is it, could someone be wrong for having a child? Uh, are they doing them a disservice? And uh, I think it's something that I think needs to be talked about, about more, uh, I think 100%. And I really appreciated this conversation because I feel like uh, that uh, I really feel like it was a respectful conversation. I feel like it was in-depth. I feel like you, you've got clearly got like a philosophical background or something that would just allow you to uh, engage with uh, like de- detailed topics. I don't know if you just read philosophy in your spare time or if you've studied it, but it, it, it seems like you studied it. And um, but yeah, I think it's, it's been insightful. Cool. Yeah. I think the the thing to, for me to go for it is is to really try to do some more some more in depth thinking about the moral value of pleasure and happiness and the good and how that relates with our behaviors and our obligations because that that's one thing that I still don't have a, a good grasp on and I think that that may actually be one of the most important things that we're talking about here. So. I think we all need to do more meta ethics, man. I think it's <laughs> it is forever. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks again for coming and uh, have a great weekend. Yeah. Thank you, guys. I uh, hope you have a lovely night. Yeah. Thank you. See you guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.